Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Miller. I'm a professor of geography and director of the Center for Urban Regional Analysis at The Ohio State University. And I'm also chair of the Mapping Science Committee. On behalf of the Mapping Science Committee, welcome to, to today's webinar on geospatial needs for, excuse me, geospatial needs for a pandemic resilient world. As a standing committee of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, the Mapping Science Committee organizes and oversees studies that provide independent advice to society and to government at all levels of geo, at all at all levels on geospatial science, technology, and policy. The MSC also addresses aspects of geographic information science that deal with the acquisition, integration, storage, distribution, and use of spatial data. Through its studies, the committee promotes the informed and responsible development and use of spatial data for the benefit of, of society. Today's webinar addresses the geospatial needs to understand, respond to, and plan for epidemics and pandemics, such as the COVID-19 outbreak. We can see that the COVID-19 pandemic has clear geographic dimensions ranging from the personal to the global. This includes the spread of the disease, the co comorbidity factors that vary geographically, the uneven burden of the disease, the distributed and heterogeneous nature of healthcare systems, and the highly variable response to interventions from political authorities and the public at large. The declines and shifts in human activities also affect broader social, economic, and environmental systems. Today's webinar will address the role that geospatial data mapping, modeling, and analysis can play in crafting effective government and societal responses at the operational, tactical, and strategical levels. We will discuss three major topics today with breaks in between. The first is modeling the spatial spread of disease and its local burden. The second is geospatial needs for rapid response. And then the third topic will be spatial indicators of resilience and recovery. In each of these, under each of these topics, we will have short presentations and allow plenty of time for discussion. Please submit any questions you have via the Q&A feature of Zoom, and these questions will be answered live by the moderators. Before we get started, I just want to acknowledge and thank the members of the Mapping Science Committee in developing this webinar. And in particular, I want to thank Daniel Brown from the University of Washington, Kathleen Stewart from the University of Maryland, and Mark, Mark Richard from the Open Geospatial Consortium. And as we noted in the opening slides that this webinar will be recorded and will be available to the public in a few weeks. So we'll get started with our, our first session on modeling the spatial spread of disease and its local burden, which will be moderated by Daniel Brown from the University of Washington. Daniel. All right, thanks, Harvey. Dan Brown, University of Washington School of Environmental and Forest Sciences. Uh, I'm really excited to be here to uh, help introduce three really interesting speakers talking about modeling in um, the context of disease and understanding disease dynamics. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought to public awareness the importance of models in understanding and managing socio-environmental risks Models help us uh, predict population level outcomes, however imperfectly, as we've learned, they help us design and test interventions. And importantly, spatial models incorporate special, spatial heterogeneity at multiple scales, from individuals to national scales, and they incorporate spatial interaction, which in the case of pandemic can drive disease dynamics. Spatial models come in many forms, ranging from those that rely heavily on fitting and extrapolating spatial temporal patterns to those that uh, focus on describing and encoding processes of movement, diffusion, and change. And uh, most practical models combine some combination of data fitting and, and process representation. In the context of the, this workshop and the Mapping Sciences Committee goals, uh, we're interested in the spatial data and the role of spatial data in these models. And the uh, spatial data informs these models in a variety of ways, providing uh, the foundational patterns on which uh, patterns are trained and tested, data about spatial interactions, and data that can help us estimate 
spatially varying parameters like R0. Ultimately, the efficacy and accuracy of models is affected by this interaction between data at different spatial and temporal resolutions collected with different sampling protocols and how those interact with the process dynamics. So uh, as we dig in, we have three experts here in disease modeling to help us understand spatial modeling effort, efforts in epidemiology related to the COVID pandemic. Our first speaker is Joshua Epstein, who's a professor of epidemiology in the New York University School of Global Public Health and founding director of the NYU Agent-Based Modeling Laboratory. Prior to joining NYU, he was a professor of emergency medicine at Johns Hopkins and director of the Center for Advanced Modeling in Social Behavioral and Health Sciences with joint appointments in economics, applied mathematics, international health and biostatistics. Before that, he was a senior fellow in economic studies at the Brookings Institution and director of the Center on Social and Economic Dynamics. For this trans for the transformative innovations that he's been working on, he was awarded the NIH Director's Pioneer Award in 2008, an honorary doctorate of science from Amherst College in 2010, and was elected to the Society of Sigma Xi in 2018. He is the author of many books, including Generative Social Science, Studies in Agent-Based Computational Modeling, and Agent Zero Toward Neurocognitive Foundations of Generative Social Science. Please join me in welcoming Joshua Epstein. Uh, let's see, see if I can do screen sharing and we'll see if we can get underway. Let's see. Okay, here we go. Start my video. Now I'm supposed to optimize something that I'm not seeing here. Hmm. hmm. Does that look optimal to uh, someone, Eric, maybe? Uh, yeah, so Josh, if you if you see the green bar for uh, Zoom, you can go to where it says more, and then you'll see one of the check boxes will be, say, optimize for video clip. Optimize. Yes, perfect, perfect. Yep. Okay, good. All right. So yes, uh, thank you, Dan, for those kind remarks. I wanted to go quickly through uh, a bunch of modeling of uh, epidemics and related geospatial issues from the scale of the playground all the way to our literally planetary scale agent-based model. So uh, the title is Epidemiology from Playground to Planet. Uh, but I wanted to begin with really, really toy models can reveal core principles of epidemiology with which some of you may not be familiar. So I thought I'd demonstrate a couple of those quickly at the playground level in an agent-based model. For those who haven't seen those, this is just a little playground of artificial uh, kids. Blue kids are healthy. This red kid is the index case, he's sick. They're gonna just move around at random. When a red bumps into a blue, he sneezes on him, gives him the bug, that turns the blue kid red. After being red for a while, you're removed from play. And depending on your mood, you can interpret that as red kids all die or they leave the playground for the infirmary, but they leave the area. Uh, I prefer to just assume they died. So here's, here's how it goes in a very simple example where there's just some probability that you give the bug to someone you contact and there's some probability per period that you're taken out. Right, so it begins slowly like most epidemics and then starts to spread much more quickly as uh, the mathematics can illustrate. And after a while in this very morbid, simple agent-based playground run, everybody gets the disease and they all die. All right, very sad, but very simple story. Everybody gets it and they all die. Okay, so of course what we're interested in is preventing that and there are several means of doing so. Uh, we try to intervene to prevent, prevent that and protect as many healthy, susceptible kids as possible. And the big tools, certainly for pandemic influenza, COVID-19, uh, these sorts of pandemic challenges, the big tools are vaccination, which in the case of COVID is really the only long-term solution, and social distancing, which is an immediate term solution. So let's talk a little bit about vaccination, just in principle, go back to the playground. There were a hundred kids, everybody got the bug and they all died. So imagine a perfect vaccine and we vaccinate 60 kids up front. Okay, so 
60 kids survive, right? I mean, if I were just the person on the street and someone came over and said, okay, I got 100 kids, I'm going to vaccinate 60 of them with a perfect vaccine, 60 of them will survive. What, is that what happens? Let's color the vaccinees, the, vaccinate everybody up front. Uh, yellow kids are the vaccinees, blue kids are the susceptibles, and red kid is our index case. Now, if vaccination protected only the vaccinees, only the yellow kids, then they'd be the only kids alive at the end of the run. So here's what actually happens. Spread certainly does occur. Okay, but at the end of the run, there's blue kids in addition to the yellow kids. So the vaccinees confer secondary protection on susceptible kids. That's called herd immunity. I'm sure you've all heard of this, but that's a nice illustration of it. More than 60 survive, so I don't have to immunize everybody to crush the epidemic. I just vaccinate enough so that it fizzles out. So what fraction V of the population has to be vaccinated to induce that die out? Well, under heroic assumptions about mixing and perfect vaccines and the rest, the vaccination level has to be at least one minus one over something. What's the something? What's the one parameter that everybody's heard about? It's the R naught. And a very cute, highly idealized, very crude, but, but useful formula is that the vaccination level must be at least one minus one over R naught. We can derive this with fancy mathematics and define R naught in a nice general manner. But for the moment, just from a from practical standpoint, if R naught is two, you have to pre-vaccinate one minus one over R naught, one over two, equals one half of the population. 1918 pandemic, r naught was about two. So a vaccination of half would have sufficed. Peak Ebola was also around two. And COVID, as uh, Dan Brown pointed out, it varies spatially, but it has reached this level in various places at various times. So as a handy indicator of roughly how much vaccination you need to do as a conservative lower bound or something like that, uh, this is a reasonable little formula. Getting the vaccine is one problem. Vaccine refusal is another problem. And uh, just quickly, you know, swine flu was a declared pandemic and 50% of Americans declined the vaccine. If you use the little formula and assume the COVID are not of two, the same level of refusal would put us right at the tipping point for a huge second wave of disease. So I think even if we get the vaccine by 2021, uh, we have a real challenge getting people to take it. And I, I'm very concerned about that. Between now and then, it's social distancing, as we're seeing all over the country. China, of course, imposed draconian isolation, uh, but they did so too, la too late, and many cats had left the bag, and things move very quickly around the planet these days. So here is a planetary scale agent-based model with about six and a half billion agents on a global map. This was featured in Nature and published in Tomax, which is a technical machine learning journal. But here's the idea. Uh, black, black pixels are healthy, red pixels are sick, and blue are uh, died or recovered. So we're going to start this in Asia. This was a work we did for the NIH Midas network on swine flu. But you can see once it gets to these high population density places, space is crucially important in all of this, it spreads very quickly. Here it goes, th rips through China in a big hurry, and gets around the world quickly by uh, global airlines. So if you want to study, here, I'll just run it ahead a little bit faster. All right, so that's about a 250-day epidemic, unmitigated epidemic, base case, business as usual. But it gets around the planet in a huge hurry. SARS was on, I think, four or five continents in 24 hours. Uh, so you want to know, what about travel restrictions? What's the optimal scale of restrictions, optimal pacing of travel restrictions? or the optimal distribution of vaccines and antivirals worldwide, you have to have some global scale representation of transmission that you can use to study interventions at this scale. All right, and I think it would be a great advance to embed infectious disease models of that type in large scale geosimulation uh, systems, geos geospatial simulation systems, and study the coupled dynamics of disease and other forces at that scale. I can think of many, but here are four sort of geospatial forcings. One is deforestation 
and changes in animal reservoirs, SARS, COVID, these are all from bats. Uh, another is climate change and the northward, northern migration of vector ranges, seasonality of diseases, and the entire process of urbanization and rising contact densities. So just for example, Ebola in, 1940, in 2014, you know, the big outbreak was 2014, but it had been around a long time. Here is a graph of Ebola deaths uh, in Africa, you know, for since 1970. Um, so why a big spike in 2014 and why was it predominantly urban? So you could say maybe it's genetic variation or something that doesn't hold up. More compelling is changes in land use, deforestation. This deforestation increases the vet vector densities in a nice nonlinear way. Uh, I mean, most of these people contract the disease in forest or harvesting bats that they then sell or other, or other animal, animal reservoir contact. But if you take the forest cover from 10 by 10 to nine by nine, it cuts the area by almost 20% and it hikes the human host contact probabilities uh, accordingly. Then there are roads connecting rural to urban and a big role for geography, remote sensing and all of this is what's happening to land cover and how does it affect contact between humans and animal reservoirs. And, you know, there's vast deforestation right in West Africa where we had Ebola. And uh, Dan knows this much better than I. These are, you can do much better than this. But this is some representation of deforestation in, in Africa. And it's a big deal in terms of diseases caught from zoonotic diseases. Deforestation also contributes to climate change and rising temperatures may in fact drive mosquito ranges north of where they've been. Dengue, we're seeing that even I think in Florida, malaria, West Nile virus, Zika was a big deal. Here's our Zika model, which is also heavily spatial. We built an artificial New York City for Zika that has every census tract, all the people, and even several million mosquitoes. And we were able to develop using mosquito trap counts from New York City and US census track level across New York, you can have a heat map of mosquito densities. And then as you march people through their daily itineraries, you can track, are they, tra are they transiting high mosquito density areas? If so, we adjust their probability of getting bitten uh, accordingly. And we can give a reasonable account of transmission of mosquito-borne diseases in large urban areas, New York City specifically. One of the interesting things about uh, Zika is of course it can be transmitted from mosquito to human, but also from human to human. And sexual transmissions can occur in the mosquito off season. Mosquitoes are dormant uh, in the fall and so forth, but sexual transmission can go on anyway. And the problem is if you continue to transmit while the mosquitoes are dormant, you're spreading Zika infected blood widely. And then when the mosquitoes come back, it's a huge second wave. So you can't relax just because it's off season for the vectors. And again, seasonality is another one of these areas that really invites uh, geospatial analysis. Here's the global model with, with very toy assumptions about seasonality. And again, I think geospatial detail would be a huge advance uh, to, I think it would be thrilling to combine these large scale infectious disease models with serious high fidelity geospatial simulation systems and study the coupled dynamics of these large systems. Um, and we don't understand seasonality very well. We don't really quite understand why flu is seasonal and so forth. It would be a big, big uh, advance to do that. Another climate related geospatial dynamic is just urbanization, which increases risks, it increases density and promotes disease transmission. And obviously in a place like New York, this was a huge factor in the initial spike of COVID, but it also increases vulnerability to all sorts of environmental shocks. And another area we've been working on is coupling atmospheric fluid dynamics with agent-based modeling. Uh, and here's an example of an artificial Los Angeles with traffic color-coded for velocity, and we'll release an airborne chemical contaminant in the in the uh, you know the harbor of Los Angeles, and the diffusion of the contaminant is is computational fluid dynamics, but the agents can decide what to do. They can decide to shelter in place, or try to evacuate, or use traffic aware routing, or 
a whole variety of things. The main, the main thing is if everybody pours out into the street, they simply increase their exposure through congestion and it worsens the outcome. So what's the optimal mix between shelter in place and evacuation? Is evacuation even feasible in a city like New York or Los Angeles? Here's another view. Uh, but again, it would be fascinating to couple these computational fluid dynamics with real urban simulations. Here's several views of the same uh, analysis. Upper left is what you saw. Top down is, uh, you know, top to up from top right is the top down view of the disperse, dispersal. Lower left is another. But of course, what you care about is how many people are exposed and what's their level of exposure in parts per million per second. And we can track that in the lower right and then assess different interventions and mixes and, you know, change the permeability of buildings, all sorts of things. Designing for resilience to this is, uh, we, can, we can do that using these models. All right, and I think a big initiative is to develop that kind of model for Los Angeles, Lower Manhattan, Washington, and build up these, what I'm calling petabyte playbooks for all the global mega cities. And think about disaster resilience in, I think the post evacuation age. Those could all be linked in a US national model. Here's our model of that. Uh, this is 300 million Americans, every zip code. And again, we tried to, tried to uh, encode their zip code to zip code contact dynamics in a travel matrix, uh, but there are 30,000 zip codes. So it's a 900 million element uh, contact matrix from zip code to zip code. Um, so quite, a, quite, a, quite an object. Uh, same color code, black is healthy, red is sick, uh, blue had the disease recovered. This is an H1N run again, starts in LA. I'm a New Yorker, so everything bad starts in LA in all of my runs. Um, but again, do you wanna close schools? Is it too late to close schools? Who has priority in vaccinations? Where do you ship things? Where is it, when is it possible to lift a quarantine? You just can't do this kind of work without serious spatial epidemic dynamic modeling. And I think that has really come into its own, but I think the joint forces with real geo simulation would be a, a watershed. So I'm very excited about discussing that. Okay, so conclusion is really the integration of geospatial and disease, and disease transmission models, I think is a crucial step. And it should be done at all these scales, local, urban, national, planetary, and implicated in all of it is land use, climate change, seasonality, urbanization, and of course, human behavior uh, that I'm also very interested in, vaccine refusal, uh, premature lifting of distancing, all of these things matter immensely, but they're coupled and they affect transmission in complex ways. Uh, and it calls for a large scale interdisciplinary modeling effort that I am excited to pursue and am happy to discuss. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Um, I think you've raised uh, some really great paths forward for integration of uh, geospatial information and agent-based modeling at large scales to understand interventions and plan for um, future pandemic uh, spread and possibilities. Uh, we're gonna save questions until the end of the session and then we'll have an opportunity for discussion of all the presentations. So I'm gonna move ahead to our next speaker who is Simon Hay. Simon is a professor in the Department of Health Metric Sciences and Director of Local Burden of Disease Group at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington here in Seattle where I am. Professor Hay obtained his doctorates from the University of Oxford where he remains a member of the congregation. He was elected to the Board of Trustees of the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene in 2012 and served as his 52nd president from 2013 to 2015. Professor Hay has received numerous awards, notably the Back Award of the Royal Geographic Society in 2012 for research contributing to public health policy and the Bailey K. Ashford Medal in 2013 and the Chalmers Medal 
in 2015 from the American Society and Royal Societies of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, respectively, uh, for distinguished work in tropical medicine. He was elected to the, the Fellowship of the Academy of Medical Sciences in 2015. In, uh, he, in 2019, he received the Tent End Innovator Prize for, uh, from Malaria No More for innovation helping to make the end of malaria possible in our lifetimes. Please join me in welcoming Simon Hay. Good morning or good afternoon, everybody, um, depending on where you are listening from. I'm uh, talking from Seattle today, so it's uh, good morning for me. Uh, first, I'd like to start with a, a thank you to the um, Mapping Science Committee for inviting me to talk today and then declare um, some conflicts of interest. So I feel a bit of an imposter uh, <laughs> in this uh, um, bunch of luminaries uh, for two reasons. The, the first is I'm not an infectious disease modeler. I, I call myself a geospatial scientist. So I am gonna talk a little bit about the, the models that um, we've been doing at the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation. Um, but the second reason I feel an imposter in this process is that uh, um, it's a massive team doing this work, uh, essentially, about a third of our institute uh, since February has been moved over on a voluntary basis to um, look at the, uh, how we work with the COVID response. So I'm representing the work of a vast number of people here and I'd like to bear that in mind. In fact, so many that I can't um, uh, bring them out individually, but it's, a, it's a sen essentially a whole institute uh, effort. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is how we should sample the world for a pandemic response. Have the next slide, please. So, as I mentioned, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the COVID-19 model uh, and present some information and background to that, how it works, where you can get the biz tools for that. So a little bit of information on how frequently it's going to be updated and the, the future directions of that. And that really sets up the rest of the talk for something that I have been much more closely involved with and much more confident to talk about, which is how we sample the world uh, for the next pandemic. So how do we improve our surveillance across the world um, so that we're better prepared uh, for the next pandemic of disease? It might seem um, odd to think about that now. We're in the midst of one, but this um, exercise has definitely brought to my attention many of the limitations in information uh, that we have available to make inferences, um, not necessarily in the US, but more, more widely across the world. So then I'll spend the majority of the talk talking about how to stratify the world globally. Uh, and obviously in this, um, surveilling the world, there are probably an infinite number of ways in which we can do it. And I'm going to try and um, basically walk through a very simple one, talking about global stratification, how we wait for population, travel time and catchments at health facilities, show an example for East Africa, and then leave that with some scoping considerations about how we might think about that in future but all tied back to what we need to drive uh, these particular models at the moment and what we've learned from the data discovery part of the um, COVID-19 modeling done at the Institute of Health Metrics Evaluation. Next slide, please. So we have been making model forecasts and scenarios now for uh, four months. And uh, basically, um, forgive the um, slightly unkempt appearance, forgive the um, work from home, you will all be uh, um, familiar with the, the, the craziness that has been um, trying to respond to information. And our institute, essentially, it was a demand-driven uh, forecast from the Washington Department of um, Health, who were interested in trying to predict the demand in the first wave of the epidemic 
for hospital hospitalizations, ICU admissions, and ventilator need. And that's where this started. And as as and as I'll explain, has expanded very, very significantly since that time. In the first instance, we used a, a very, very simple curve fit model. Um, and uh, that proved to be useful for uh, the intended task, which was to uh, predict when the peak of hospitalizations would be in state by state across the US. But as time moved on and we started to look at more detailed parts of the disease transmission process, as we just heard about in the, in the last talk, we had to switch to a, um, a classic SEIR um, deterministic modeling framework. And that's what we use at the moment. I won't go into that in a great deal of detail, and I'm going to um, give you a, a website link to uh, go and beam into that as much detail as you can and the, the visualizations in, the, in a moment. But it's the standard um, R0 equation with uh, different um, uh, compartments for susceptible, infected, exposed, recovered. Um, they move between at different rates, parameterized by information uh, that we get on infections, cases, and antibody prevalence, and um, systematic reviews of various things like death rates per capita, um, mobility, um, the effect of social distancing mandates, the efficacy of masks, et cetera, et cetera. We also um, add a seasonal component. And being from the IHME, where we have the global burden of disease, we have lots of information where we can um, parameterize those covariates. So we also link those into the models as well. The thing that I'll talk to about today isn't the uh, scenarios that we're spending a lot of time looking at at the moment. So we can try and work out a range of policy options that might be available uh, to decision makers in the, in the coming months to deal with where the epidemic is going to go into the fall and towards the end of the year. Um, and we'll talk about this uh, reference forecast, but which is our best, and I am going to use the word guess, our best prediction about what we think will happen um, over the next few months. So if we could have the next slide, please. This is the, if you look on the website today, um, the URL on the bottom left of the slide, this is our predictions for COVID. 19 deaths, uh, total deaths on the y axis and the date or timeline on the x axis. You can see that the epidemic in the US, as everybody knows, started in around April and the uh, uh, end of May, end of March, beginning of April, I beg your pardon, and the deaths started um, accumulating from them. You can see from this site as well, we've got total deaths daily deaths, infections, hospital use, and uh, social mandating. So we can, uh, social distancing mandate. So we can look at those for, uh, at the, in this case, state level in the US. If we can move on to the next slide, please. Um, and this reminds me to say um, that this is, this is where we started, essentially just doing this for Washington state. You can see that the, um, it's the same graph as, a part, uh, as the previous um, presentation but zoomed into uh, Washington or specific to Washington. And you can see that the predictions are on the left, that, sorry, the observed is on the left of the slide as, as I look at it. So March, April, May, June, that's not a model prediction. That's uh, the smooth data that we've seen in the state. And the prediction is the dotted line with the uncertainty around it going out at this point in time to October the 1st. The, all of the details about how that's done, all of the data that goes into that, the code um, that's um, run to do it is all available on the, the website and updated pretty much daily in um, blogs that, go, that accompany that. So I'm gonna leave that there as a, as a description of what, what we do, um, and then talk about some of the bits that I've been much, much more involved in, in terms of the collection of data. 
and the problems that, that this um, pandemic has revealed in our capacity for surveillance. So if I could have the next slide, please. So in our SEIR models um, for the US, we get um, data on cases and deaths by state, et cetera, et cetera. But if we need to move those down to hospital demand, obviously we need to start knowing about the healthcare infrastructure. So in a given hospital, how many staff are there? What are the number of beds? How many intensive care units? Um, what diagnostics are available? Do they have the WHO list of essential medicines? Are there isolation wards? Is there PPE? Are there ventilators, et cetera? There's a long list of information that we need in the micro simulation part of this model for um, hospital demand, which um, to, bring, to, to bring to the main conclusion of this um, paper, uh, of this talk, just don't exist at the moment uh, in any uh, nice global repository where you can download them. So a huge amount of time at IHME in the uh, last few months uh, so that we can parameterize these models in space and not just do them for the US has been trying to get these information globally. And I'm gonna talk about um, the limitations of that and perhaps thinking about how we could improve that for the future. So if I could have the, sorry, the limitations of that data search process and how we could uh, improve that for the future so that we're more prepared for the, for the next pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. So obviously being um, my day job, or my day job in 2019, in 2020, it's been quite different, um, has been the Global Burden of Disease Study and essentially auditing um, disease and death around the world for a whole range of causes and conditions um, from, for as many geographies as we can, uh, and attributing those to as many different causes and risk factors as possible. And my specific job within the Institute to take those down to as fine a spatial resolution as we can. So here's, um, uh, I'll show you a map. We're talking about uh, geospatial. And one of the first things we have to think about when um, doing surveillance of the world is to chop the world up. And uh, there are many ways to do that um, from ecozones to habitats, this is the, the classic view of the world that we have, um, GPD super regions, which um, bring the world together in regions of epidemiological coherence. Again, I can point you to papers uh, that support and talk about that methodology, but it's not really the object of the, the talk. We just use that as a first cut to stratify the world and think about how we might sample that. And the next slide, please. Obviously, across that distribution, um, population is one of the things that, that vary enormously. And um, all of this histogram shows is that by those big super regions, um, there are very different percentages of the global population represented in each of those. So the first thing that we thought about, if you go on to the next slide, is to categorize those um, those regions that I've just shown you in the map uh, and give them the percentage of the total population. I'm going to focus a little bit more on Sub-Saharan Africa, as that's one of the areas that we've been trying to collect lots and lots of information. And uh, basically, we find it very, very difficult. Um, and to try and think about how we could make that job easier. So we set ourselves the challenge of how, if we could play back, um, to the start of the year, how would we set up a surveillance system which would give us the information globally that we needed to drive uh, these models in, a, in an efficient way um, that was timely and we could hence respond to uh, countries and international organizations in a very quick manner uh, when they're wanting to know about what the impact of this disease was. So looking back, we, we've kind of looked at how many um, and I'll, I'll go into this when we, we talk about the considerations. But the problem set we started with is how do we distribute 2,000 um, surveillance sites across the world? 
So we first stratified the world and made that available by, uh, sorry, and made that total of 2000. We've distributed that population weighted in those particular epidemiological regions. And I, and I do that just to show, um, and if we look at the South Asia, East Asia and Oceania region, simply that population density um, look at the world there. And it's obviously, we want to sample for that because it's the humans that we're worried about in relation to um, uh, pandemics, uh, at least in hospital usage um, predictions. And we can see that the, there's a massive variance in um, population between the oceanic islands. So we, we, we sample that with three to countries like India and China. So you can have a, in one of the regions is 467. I'm going to go to the next slide, please. So once we've distributed those 2,000 catchment, uh, those 2,000 surveillance sites across the world, we have a, an approximate number of sites that we need to distribute within each one of those groups. We do that with um, this population um, accessibility cost distance sur uh, surface published by Vice et al. in 2018 in Nature, and use that with a, a, a data set of um, about 5,000 health facility locations from WHO. And once we've defined the catchments for those based on uh, a minimum distance of um, travel time, uh, thesian polygons around uh, each of those uh, facilities, we then choose those within a country to say, of the, the sample that we give you out of the 2000, uh, place 50% of them in the highest population catchments to be, again, to try and be representative of urban populations, and then distribute the balance, so the next 50%, to um, basically be representative as possible of the entire country. And by definition, those tend to be in the more rural populations. I'm going to show you how that works for East Africa in the the next set of slides. So could I have the next slide, please? So this is an East African subset. Um, and for those of you who know your East African geography very well, it will be easy to match the table on the left to the uh, map on the right. If you don't, um, I'll beam you into one country. So if you look at the most populous one in that region, which is Ethiopia, so that gives a balance of 25 sentinel sites that we'd like to distribute in that particular country. If you go to the next slide, please. This is where all the hospitals are, according to this um, database from WHO. And here's one of the first big problems that even information as simple as the location of all the hospitals in the world is not known. So and that's quite a bold statement. It is known locally, but there is not one central resource where you can go to and say, this is, this is all of the health facilities across the world and where they're located. It's highly variable. Um, and I, uh, just even that in itself is, is something that needs to be um, looked at and done much more uh, comprehensively across the world. So for Ethiopia, it says we've got 161 hospitals. I suspect there's many more, especially in the secondary and tertiary parts of the health system. But using those, if we go on to the next slide, you can distribute those uh, 25 sites between them uh, with those decision rules, and that's what the, the pink dots are there. If you go on to the next slide, uh, that repeats that same process for all all of Africa, all of um, Sub-Saharan Africa, I beg your pardon. And you can see that we can do that to, to come up with um, the, the global sample of science that we need. So in the next slide, um, I just wanted to bring up for um, discussion, and we're at the end of the talk now, of if we had this um, surveillance system, what are the kinds of things that we would need to look at um, so the first is, you know, is 2000 too ambitious or too conservative? I imagine all of us would have um, different expectations or views on which number we should choose. 
We don't even know where the locations of all of these facilities are in the world. There's feasibility and cost, um, things to weigh up between how many samples. Should it be daily, weekly, or monthly? What's the minimum set of information we need for each of those? How do we um, correctly balance agility? That is the ability to collect new information versus mission creep, everybody wanting different information from uh, these different facilities. How do we push or pull this information? Who pays to establish and then to maintain? And what do we call a baseline? Um, I'm gonna finish there. Uh, next slide, please. And I've just essentially tried to um, set this talk up as a, as a discussion. If you, just to recap, if you want to look into the detailed um, SER R models, they're in the, um, and they'll be made available in the web resources that I, I pointed you to before, and the predictions are updated daily. At the moment, they're available for the US, um, Europe, high income, Latin America, and we're starting to make those about, uh, models available for other parts of the world, um, Africa and India, which we're very concerned about where the COVID uh, uh, pandemic, how the COVID pandemic will impact in those countries. But as I mentioned in the talk, we've got uh, data problems in each of those locations that we need to look at. And this is one potential solution about how we might um, sample the world to be better prepared in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. Um, wow, I think this is really great uh, bookend of talks in a way on one hand, looking at the mechanisms and uh, simulations of the processes of uh, disease dynamics. And on the other hand, the challenge of uh, adding geographic realism into those models uh, through uh, spatial data, which is ultimately the detail that uh, both of you have identified and the committee is very much interested in how spatial data can inform our understanding of these processes and our uh, intervention to reduce the burden of disease. And um, you've identified, you've both identified in a way the need for the, these data to come together. And Simon, you've identified some really important challenges for the databases and data needs. So very much appreciate that. And again, we're going to hold off on questions until the final speaker to, in this session, which is uh, Shauna Hearn, who is a professor of geography and director of the Center for Analysis and Research of Spatial Information at Hunter College at the City University of New York. As founding, founder and director of CARSI, uh, Dr. Hearn played a central role in managing the design development and implementation of the digital geographic base map for the city of New York called NYC map in the 90s and early 2000s. NYC map was instrumental in enabling the city of New York to respond to the 9-11 crisis. Dr. Hearn's role was highlighted in the history channels, the twin towers rise and fall of an American icon. He pioneered the first statewide model for West Nile virus hotspot detection in California in 2005, modeling every quarter square mile every day. He directed the solar uh, New York State portal software development effort in a project funded by the US Department of Energy. He is past president of the University Consortium for University uh, Geographic Information Science. He was appointed by the United States Secretary of the Interior to the National Geospatial Advisory Committee as a charter member in 2008. And Professor Hearn re received the prestigious 2013 IBM Faculty Award. Please welcome Sean. Thanks very much, Dan. Um, I'll be talking about an embedded recursive SIR model for county level analysis. And um, actually first started thinking about epidemiological models uh, about 20 years ago when West Nile virus came to the shores of New York City. And uh, the city was in a panic. They didn't know what it was. They actually sprayed the whole city before they specified where the hotspots were. Mm -hmm. So they actually hired our team to look at where the hotspots were. And we used the spatial temporal model informed by ecology and, and the epidemiology. And we implemented that model, not only in New York, but also Chicago and for the whole state of California, where we ran it for three years. 
So um, that gave me some context for thinking about this. Next slide, please. Um, and um, you know, what's the best approach? And there's different ways of thinking about uh, how to approach this problem. The first one, uh, next, it could be a data-driven approach. Uh, the problem is the data was poor, as everybody knows. Um, the case data was extremely spotty. Testing wasn't really there. Um, and using a data-driven approach with poor data uh, is obviously a problem. Um, also, using a data-driven approach, there's no constraint on what's possible. And this can lead to gross overestimations of, of death counts, and, and that did for, for some of the data-driven models. Next. Um, so we see that everybody's gravitating towards the classic epidemiolo epidemiological models. Um, even with poor data, at least you're contextualizing it in a framework. And epidemiology captures the process of viral spread and attenuation. Um, and model, the model provides constraints on what's possible, right, frankly. Next, please. So I'll talk about uh, sort of the elephant in the room, which is the SIR model. We have susceptible individuals. We have infected individuals and we have recovered individuals and those that did not recover. And those people have an origin where they live. There's transportation involved. Next, please. Um, and there's a destination that they're going to. So this is kind of our conceptual model of both the, the, the nature of the, the disease, the epidemiology, as well as sort of the geographic components of it. Um, and um, this looks like California because I only see cars. <laughs> it's definitely not New York. And so uh, next, please. Um, the two key um, parameters to this model, actually, uh, Josh talked about are not, which is if I'm sick, how many people do I make sick? Um, and the other is, um, I call it diffusion. Uh, it's also a epidemiology called the contact ratio. So if you want to replace one for the other, you can going forward. I call it diffusion just because it, it feels to me like diffusion. Um, next, please. Um, this looks more like New York uh, with uh, subways and uh, buses and people walking. I threw a plane in there. That's another issue, of course. Um, and the nature of their interaction. Next. And if we look at those key parameters for New York, we see a row of 2.6 and a diffusion of 0.107 or 10.7% of the population. The interesting thing here is that LA and New York have very similar populations, you know, 8 million plus or minus, uh, but very, very different row and diffusion factors um, for the same virus. Next, please. So our goal is to understand and reduce transmission and predict the trajectory of the virus. And these are the two key parameters. Next. Um, so our logical model, um, we're going to use a, a modification of the SIR model. Next. And we're going to model deaths, not cases, just due to the lack of testing. I think I actually did both, um, but um, deaths are more reliable um, I think going forward, perhaps case data will be if, if we can actually get our testing up there. We're also gonna model every county separately and then sort of create a summation of all those counties. Next. Um, the parameters that we're using, um, these are assumptions, the death rate, uh, 0.023. I'm using the death rate from Korea just because they had the most rigorous testing regime and so their numbers for death rate are probably reasonably. Obviously, this is an assumption, and we can discuss that. Uh, initial rate of infection, IO, 0.00125. What is the nugget of those infected individuals? The duration of the disease, uh, 21 days, seems to be out there. I actually have personal experience because I had the virus. And believe it or not, I was you know, miserably sick for 21 days, and then I finally got better. Uh, so uh, that's a sample of one. Um, so the two parameters that we're going to be estimating next, uh, the calculated parameters are going to be rho and uh, the diffusion parameter. Next, please. Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, go back one. I, 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 I wanna show. So this is actually the generating um, equation. Uh, we call this P prime. Um, and there's 
three parameters here. One is beta and beta is equal to rho times nu, which is that 21 day, only that's a daily rate. Um, so that's beta and then we have time and we have the initial condition. If you take this equation and multiply it by the population and the diffusion rate, you're going to get uh, prevalence. And so from prevalence, you can then generate suscepti uh, susceptibility, infection and, and repl uh, replacement. Um, so this one equation is really the workhorse for this entire model. Next, please. Um, now we had policies that affected these two parameters. We had a pre-lockdown and you could think of Rho as a function of place and how um, infectious the disease is. It's sort of the combination of those two things. Diffusion, one can think of that as a, some function of movement. During lockdown in the model, what we did is we took the date of lockdown for each of the states and we applied a decay function to Rho and diffusion basically stalled generally. Um, although we'll, I'll show you how it's fit. And then we looked at the open updates and Rho would then increase as some percentage of pre-lockdown and the diffusion rate would also increase as some percentage of lockdown. And that's kind of a key question. What should those percentages be? Next, please. So this is the curve modeling process and this is New York City. And so what you have here, the reason I call it an embedded recursive because it's actually a recursive call within a recursive call because you've got two parameters you're kind of trying to fit. So blue is the data and red is the model. And you can sort of think of this as like a ping pong match where you're fitting one parameter and, the, and you get a little closer to a solution and the other parameter gets knocked off, you push it in. And so it's sort of like two steps forward and one step back for each parameter until you converge at the net. Uh, and that's what you're seeing right here where it captures the curve um, it, it really models the data very nicely. And so this is done for every single county in the United States. And we'll see that there's spatial variation in both of these parameters, as, as you can imagine. Next, please. So this is kind of what the classic SIR looks like uh, in terms of susceptible individuals. Next. Uh, infected individuals and the recovering individuals and the past in individuals in purple. And here you've got a row of 2.68, as I mentioned before, and 10.7 diffusion. And this is what would happen if that diffusion sort of stalled and we didn't really infect any additional people. This is what it would look like. Next slide is what it looks like when we take, and just one more click, I'll get the, we'll get the rate. When we take the pre-lockdown rate and we apply that to the open up period. In this case, we're taking some percentage. In this case, it's 25% of that previous rate. And we're going to change that diffusion rate. And we're also going to be adjusting rho. Um, and this is the result you get for New York City. So we're going up to 30,000 deaths by August 26th. Um, and we're doing this for every single county in the United States. And a key question is, what should that percent be? Um, and of course, it's going to vary geographically. Um, New Yorkers are very serious about their masks. I was out in Denver recently and they are not. So um, how each region reacts to these different um, prescriptions for, for social distancing, et cetera, is going to affect these parameters. Next, please. So this is kind of the map. Um, and it's, there's a whole bunch of interesting things going on here. So this is modeling every single county for the two parameters row um, and diffusion. I'm just showing Rho here, uh, but if you just take a look at where the international borders are and, and the entry points, if you look up in Washington state, we've got very high Rho values there in the middle of Montana, um, northern Minnesota, and look at Maine. <laughs> there's nothing up there, but there are, is a border and there's a lot of people passing through there. And I think if you look at the Michigan area and the New York area, you'll find the same. So there's a whole bunch of spatial things going on here. So let's just kind of cruise around the country and look at different cities and, and, and the fit. So next, please. Um, so this is Denver, Colorado. We have a row of 1.89, diffusion of 0 0.038. Next. We have um, Columbus, Ohio, 1.83, 0 0.022. So keep in mind, we're only looking at 2.2% of the population. So if we think this is over, we're not, you know, 
Okay, this is very interesting. New Orleans, one of the highest row values of 3.063 with a diffusion of 10.4%. And um, you know, models should intuitively make sense. And anybody who's been to New Orleans knows how gregarious the population is, how tightly packed things are. And so, uh, you know, th this is kind of a good logic test. Yeah, New Orleans does have a high row value. Totally understand that. Next, one more. Yeah, so this is Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and Atlanta's kind of split between two counties. We have a 1.8 and a 0 0.013. Next, please. Um, Fairfield County is an interesting one. Pretty high row value, 2.3 and a 10%. Now, Fairfield is, is really a lot of Fortune 500s there, but it's also a bedroom community for New York. So obviously there's a relationship there and we've got Metro North, which brings hundred, probably hundreds of thousands of people a day to New York City. So you can understand why we had a high world value there. Anytime you're in a confined space, uh, like a, a train or a bus, um, the world value is gonna kick up. Uh, next, I think I had a couple more, Los Angeles, we've seen that one. And one more is, uh, I believe, Chicago, Cooks County, um, 1.56 and 5%. And you can see how well the model fits the data for each one of these. Uh, and you can sample any of the counties and that's generally quite, quite true uh, in the case. Next, please. So bottom line prediction, um, August 7th, 2020, if we use that 25% uh, for the rate of 25% for the pre-shutdown uh, uh, going forward, we're going to end up with about 172,000 deaths by August 7th. Um, if we were to use 0.15, we would end up with 154,000. Um, and actually, when I was looking quickly at your chart, chart of Simon, it, it looked to me like um, that's in the ballpark of what that model uh, uh, predicted. Next, please. Okay, so the, the real issue is how do we come up with estimates of row and diffusion going forward? Next. New sources of movement data could provide the solution. Movement data of individuals from apps has been consolidated to capture movement, movement from origin to destination, diffusion. Next. Um, next, please. And proximity of devices can be used to calculate row. Next. Uh, these data can be used to calibrate both diffusion and row by relating it to output model. And next slide, I'll show, you know, sort of how a metric might work. Uh, in this case, diffusion, how many people from a zip code are going to other zip codes. Next, how many uh, from other zip codes are coming to my zip code. Next, we can take that and sum it and normalize it by population as the first metric. So that's a possible metric. Row is another one. Uh, next, please. And... Um, here, we're looking at close contacts, and, and a lot of the vendors will give you a five-minute interval for close contact. Here, it's for individuals in the zip, how many people are they connecting with? When they go out, how many do they connect? For people coming into the zip, how many do they connect with? And um, how many do they connect with when they're outside of the zip? So some summation of this and normalized po by the population could give us an estimate of growth. So keep in mind, we're gonna use that to relate to the model parameters and the estimates that the models have come up with for both of these uh, variables. Pre shut down, uh, calibrate it, and then use that relationship to determine those two metrics going forward. Next, please. Um, of course, I'm interested in the geographic components of this, and these are all of the a subset probably of the different types of geographic information that we're interested in. Uh, next, um, the real key question is what's the best lever of granular granularity for these analyses? Um, and what's the real relationship between these geographic correlates and these two parameters? Um, next. Okay, conclusion, a modified recursive SIR model was used to predict COVID-19 trajectory into the future. New mobile data sources are now available to calibrate two key parameters of the model, row and diffusion. And process-based models have the advantage of constraining predictions to realistic scenarios of what is likely and what is possible. Next. Uh, I'd just like to thank the New York Times for the data and thank uh, Harvey Miller and Ann Lynn and the rest of the Mapping Science Committee 
for organizing this workshop. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Sean. Um, really nice uh, sort of bringing together of the data questions and the modeling questions. I'm gonna take a moderator prerogative and ask a clarifying question on your presentation, Sean, if you don't mind. Um, sure. the, I, I, I love the sort of county level estimation of R0 as, a, as an interesting sort of um, indication of process and how it varies across space. My question has to do with the meaning of R0 in that situation. R0, if we interpret it as the number of people and an infected individual infects, you interpreted the counties at the borders as having higher R0s, presumably because there's people coming in and out of those counties, which maybe isn't the same as internal county spread, but it's importation of cases that elevates seemingly the R0, but it's not really R0 that's being elevated, right? Right, in some ways it's the diffusion that's being affected by that. Uh, but the two aren't independent. Um, you know, one thing, one of my students for his class project overlaid the subway lines onto the map of prevalence. And sure enough, there was a bunch of the zip codes which had very high prevalence, but no, no uh, subway stops. So we're like, what's going on there? Well, what's going on there is that those people are taking buses. That's a more confined space than a subway car. So mm -hmm. perhaps the R0 is pushed up because they're in a more concentrated space than the mm -hmm. folks in the subway, just a hypothesis. But these are the kind of things that we can start to think about once we start to spatialize these parameters and try to understand what is driving them. Yeah, very interesting. Um, we have one question here from um, Budu Baduri for all three speakers, uh, and it's sort of a general question. How does geospatial epidemiology inform geospatial science that geospatial scientists or geographers did not already know? So are we uh, learning something here that is um, a generalizable to the science of geospatial information? And uh, he offers this alternative, otherwise is geospatial epidemiology an oxymoron. Uh, anybody wanna take a whack at that? Well, I, I guess the way I see this is, uh, I always say never underestimate the value of a strong conceptual model. And um, in this case, we're marrying geospatial principles uh, and, and analysis techniques, data science techniques, with um, a process model, uh, in this case, the epidemiological model. And I think that's what GI scientists do. Uh, they oftentimes work with other disciplines to take their sort of toolkit and apply it to a process model, which informs the way in which they use those tools. Yeah, as an epidemiologist, I would say that I, I have the feeling that geospatial sciences can do more for epidemiology than epidemiology can do for geospatial sciences, but I'm not a geospatial scientist, so I really don't know. But I, I agree with Sean that the main point is that the coupling of these disciplines is, is a very powerful uh, new tool to study public health, but also economic dynamics, urbanization, I mean, a million other things. So I think the, 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 that, that the model, modeling contagion dynamics of all sorts and geospatial mapping is a very fertile union scientifically. I, may I add to those comments? Yes, please. The, I, I, I would just like to support those and say, um, uh, add perhaps a, a, a third reason for being a, an imposter here is that um, I, in the, the presentation I gave, I said that this, there were um, essentially lots of people working on this at the, the organization. And they, they are essentially siloed in um, infectious disease modeling work, do, doing that um, in locations that basically operate independently. So they wouldn't, um, they, they wouldn't fit my definition of, of being geospatial models. Where the geospatial, that doesn't mean that they couldn't and shouldn't. And uh, I, I think we've had um, great talks um, showing about how uh, those things can be combined. Where in our um, process, the ITME process, that we um, have started to do 
um, make more realistic, if you like, some of those um, locational variances is in the covariates that we put together. So I did talk a lot about that, but we have um, obviously distributed samples of um, from Facebook, the uh, numbers of people wearing masks. We have distributed information on mandates, uh, when and when they're um, applied, uncertainty around those. Um, seasonality, so when is pneumonia worse? We use that as a, as a covariate in our model. Many of those things are inherently spatial, and we use classic geospatial techniques to build those um, covariates to inform the model. So maybe just a bit of clarification there. Using those in a uh, much more intelligent and sort of coupling um, epidemiological disease process models with features that you can get from the landscape from geospatial models is obviously a wonderful place to be and a lovely, lovely aspirational goal. It um, has some fairly big computer challenges for us as well, which I, I, I'm not sure if the um, other, other panelists would echo. But uh, running those things at higher and higher um, spatial resolution with more and more dimensions is um, becomes challenging. Thank you. Thank you. We have a, a several other questions. Um, I'm gonna just start sort of as they came in. Um, Alexandra Sokol asks, uh, Josh, what tools are you using to build these models? Maybe. Oh, good question. It, it depends entirely on the scale of the model. I mean, a playground model like that, we use uh, NetLogo, which is a very, very easy to learn uh, programming language specifically designed for agent-based modeling. For the larger models, it's Python or you know C++ or, or Java. I mean, industrial strength programming languages for the big models, but for the prototypes, the toy models, gain insight, teach principles, we use, uh, we really do use NetLogo, which is lovely for this. And then if you want to do, uh, the, typically we do the differential equations model, and then we do an agent-based model and see why they differ and how space becomes interesting. And for the mathematical model, I use East Mathematica or MATLAB. So on the math side, MATLAB, Mathematica, something like this. And on the computing side, depends on the scale from NetLogo for toy to, you know, Java or Python or C++ for the industrial strength models. Do either of you want to offer a quick sort of response on that question, Sean or Simon? Uh, on, the, on the software environment? Yeah. Oh, sure. Uh, so the model, uh, our model is written all in Python. Um, yeah. Whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, same here, a combination of, um, Python for the um, production environment, and often people will use R in the yeah, R, right, of course, data. To, yeah. Same. Um, change things, and it's and we run it on the Azure cloud to um, get all the simulations running in a semi-timely fashion. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another question comes from Manish Verma. Um, how how do we interpret? R0, and this is probably mainly for Sean, but maybe for the others as well. How do we interpret R0 and diffusion into um, what that might mean for policy? And I, I guess there's kind of a, another question comes in that's somewhat related to this. A lot of this work is in urban areas. What, do we, what does this work tell us about less um, densely populated areas? Well, can I, can I make one comment about R0? I mean, R0, its subscript is zero because what it's usually understood to mean is if I take a completely virgin bowl of susceptible individuals and drop a single infected into the bowl, how many susceptibles will that person infect directly with no secondary transmission or anything else? Now, of course, as susceptibles, if you run out of susceptibles, the reproductive number falls because you know you, you can't keep doubling rabbits you run out of rabbits right i mean the point is that uh, the r0 is the first reproductive number but the reproductive numbers fall as the epidemic expands because you run out of gas you run out of susceptibles so using r0 as if it's a constant like a interest rate that just doubles and doubles and doubles and doubles overstates the actual scale of the of the disease uh, and it's also, you know, varies by, by space and in, in a variety of other ways. But I think this is one uh, kind of scary 
misuse of R0 as if it were just a compound interest rate. It, it really isn't because you run out of susceptibles. Yeah, I totally agree with Josh on that. <clears throat> I think part of it seems to be, you know, and I think there's a lot of research on this, um, how confined the space is and the, the duration of the exposure impacts are. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why, you know, these, pre these demonstrations are very scary for that reason, just because right. people, you know, they are outside, but they're very tightly coupled for long periods of time. Absolutely. I mean, uh, properly speaking, R0 is not a property of the pathogen. It's no. a consequence of the pathogen and the contact dynamics. And so in yeah. many, you know, scientific studies, you'll see, you know, smallpox, R0 ranges from A to B, uh, depending on is it Bangladesh, is it Berlin, right. you know, all of this stuff. I, I mean, some of the um, things that if I think about how I would translate some of those thinkings into policy is um, obviously across the geospatial landscape. And if we were to um, think about the US at this point in time, there are places, and as we've seen from these, these infections that, uh, so, sorry, from these simulations and the, and the work of the other panelists, that will have different intrinsic um, our values, so we'll support um, epidemics at higher or slower rates. That kind of starts to imply that thinking about uh, the US as a contiguous whole um, for policy response is perhaps not our um, most sensible option. And one of the things that we've seen that was, that was really surprising to me is um, in terms of the putting mandates on in the US, if you look at the timing of those, I would have expected states to adjust those according to when the big surge in cases were. But actually, if you look at them, there, were, there was a, a big um, coherence in the time and everybody sort of put them on within a, within a week window um, because of herd behavior, I think, just because if that, that state's done it, we can't be seen to be being, being high. Um, whereas these types of dynamics would lead you to think that there are um, much more state and county specific um, timings of some of these things that you would want to, um, and if you're thinking about it just from policy perspectives, if you're wanting to control migration and movement of people, there are some areas that you'd be much more worried about seeding infections to, uh, to others. Um, I'm not saying that that should be a policy, but that, that would be one of the realms that you would, uh, uh, or I would start to think about. Yeah, if, if you noticed some of the East Coast um, curves, like for New York City, for Fairfield County, for New Jersey, I didn't show New Jersey, but Fairfield, uh, but even New Orleans were starting to, to curve down, whereas all the other ones I showed were still on the total upward trajectory. Yeah. So this, this whole policy of opening up may have made some sense in New York and some of these other places where you had a 10% uh, rate of, of exposure of the population. But for some of these other cities where they had 2%, I'm not so sure. Harvey, how are we doing on time? We're a little over. Do we want to? We're a little over. We want to, um, this has been a great discussion, but I think we want to give people a chance to take a little break and get away from the computer screens for, for 10 minutes. So I think we'll have to call it here. Okay, right. thanks everyone. Thank, Terrific. Thank, I just want to thank the speakers again. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Dan, and thanks, thanks, speakers. That was a great session. We're off to a good start. So we are going to take a short break. We'll be back at um, two thirty with our second topic: geospatial needs for rapid response. See you in ten. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to from your from our break. The next topic in our workshop today will be on geospatial needs for rapid response, and I'll be moderating the session. So we ha our first uh, of four talks will be from the USGS. We have a, a joint presentation from Maria Pepler and Chris Cretini. Maria Pepler serves as the USGS Emergency Management Coordinator. Her scope of work includes all hazards and missions. Her primary responsibilities include unifying USGS response teams to support the sharing of resources and skills, ensuring, ensuring the science is used in, in the decision-making process, coordinating safe access to, to USGS scientists and technicians into hazard zones, 
updating continuity and preparedness plans and training USGS staff to interact with the emergency management community. Maria previously worked as the Deputy Director of the Integrated Information Dissemination Division in the Water Mission Area and as the Federal Agency Liaison for the Office of Service Water and as the National USGS Flood Inundation Mapping Coordinator. Maria started her career at the Wisconsin Water Science Center as a fluvial geomorphologist and project coordinator for the Web Informatics and Mapping Project. Chris Cristini, excuse me, Chris Cretini, sorry, serves as the USGS National Geospatial Program in the National Geospatial Program and is the National Map Liaison to Arkansas, Florida, Louisiana, Puerto Rico, and the US Virgin Islands. He works to develop data acquisition and stewardship agreements to ensure the availability of common base data across a broad range of users and applications. Chris is a member of the USGS Geospatial Information Response Team, which ensures that timely geospatial data are available for use by emergency responders, land and resource managers, and for scientific analysis. Chris and Maria, thank you very much for your time today, and I'll let you uh, start your presentation. Thanks, Harvey. The mute button moved there when we switched around, so <laughs> thanks. And thanks everyone, thanks to the um, National Academies and the Mapping Science Committee for having us here. USGS has been involved um, with this committee for a while. This is not my first time here, and my, uh, but my background is very um, unusual. In this particular response, I have really been managing the USGS's response to the COVID-19. And, and for us, that has looked very, very different than it does for um, the USGS, our normal job during hazards and data delivery. Um, and, and I really just thought with this presentation, I would, I would speak sort of from a different perspective and, and sort of get us back to basics about the criticality of authoritative data sources. And it's interesting because the first uh, panel, I think all three presenters really outlined the need for authoritative data. We're turning to these models and tweaking models with sort of the best we have, but I'm pretty sure I think I heard each one admit that, that the data that they're working with is not ideal for their situation. Um, so if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so speaking of getting back to basics, I wanted to point out that the USGS mission, and I'm not going to read this, but we work in sort of a really wide range of, um, of disasters, natural, biological, you name it, and our role is very much to provide that reliable scientific information. We are the bottom of the data pyramid in a lot of the different sciences and resources. Not all of them, and we do a lot of research and modeling around that. But I think that um, it's important to note that, that we sort of have a different role in these, in these products. So I have two examples, if you go to the next slide about that. Um, and it's important to note about this emergency management operations center. Much of the science that gets used in, in an emergency operations center um, gets ingested through that geospatial unit. In those multi-agency, multidisciplinary responses, these maps are an example from a few years ago um, in 2018, the Kilauea eruption. You know, it was our mappers, modelers, and, um, and scientists, geoscientists that were producing these products, feeding them into the emergency operations center that sort of drive the, drove the evacuations. So very much at the cornerstone of that science-informed decision-making. Next slide. And I think I really hope that most people that are in earthquake zones are familiar with the USGS's sort of central role as the global source of information for earthquakes. We produce these um, pager alerts, which is a derivative product from our global seismic network that correlates the shake map with actually fatalities and economic loss estimations. So really putting that data actionable information. And I was personally involved in the Puerto Rico response this last January, and it's really clear that good data informed good decisions. And I think that that was really the crux of the modeling discussions in the first section. So if you go to the next slide, I'll put my hat on as, as sort of the responder now instead of the data provider. And, and this is where I'd like to note that pandemic data is complex, incredibly local, which I think was really one of um, Sean's points. And, and for the USGS, a shift in that it's not our own. Um, we, we sort of struggled, and I think that this is typical as of many groups that are trying to make operational decisions about which data do we use. 
uh, the New York Times, the Johns Hopkins, the CDC COVID data tracker. I include one of my emails here in the bottom because very early on, as an emergency manager, I got an email from the HHS secretary's response. And I was like, oh gosh, this data is great because it has to be better, right? So we spun our wheels for like two days thinking that this was the best data. It turns out it's exactly the same as the publicly available CDC and data. I just got it like 10 hours earlier. So is that gonna, you know, and, and the sort of general confusion around which data is the best, which model is going to be using the best data and which data can I use to make operational decisions for my staff and employees. And I think that this is something that state and local and federal and every single person and individual that's trying to do this is trying to sort through all of this information. And there's no right or wrong answer. Um, I put the geo health platform from HHS on here because um, this turned out to be a pretty critical resource, but it is available by password only. You have to request an account in order to get at some of the information. So it's only available to certain people. And I want to note one of the questions that was asked but not answered in the first panel was about sort of data that's unavailable or, un, or available in uneven ways. I think that that equity of data access is really crucial in trying to make these decisions. And there's a lot of reasons to make not all the data public. Um, but I think that there are a lot of reasons to sort of centralize around a common um, authoritative data source so that we can all be kind of working from the same pieces of paper. Um, now, this is, is really difficult because these things are hard to count for any number of reasons. But I think that the same way that we sort of centralize the authoritative data sources on a lot of other things, I think that a lot of us have realized that epidemiology could benefit from this type of information. And this information, while, while complex, is inherently spatial. We all live in one place, we're all germ vectors in one place, and we touch other people. It's just kind of part of the process. So if you go to the next slide, I wanted to touch on sort of what did we do? What did USGS do? And very much what did the Department of the Interior do? I'll speak up here um, because we do not have public health officials, although the Park Service does in their interactions with the, um, so it, with the public. So we had a lot of advice from public health um, officials, but you know, it's sort of how do we make these operational decisions fast? Do we close everything? Do we all telework? How do we sort of function in this new environment? And, and I'm, gonna, I'm about to pass it off to Chris to go through sort of what did we actually use to help make our operational decisions. But the bottom line is, no matter how many data sources there were and how whether we felt they were best, better, you know, better or what is good enough for my use are really difficult questions that I'm not even going to attempt to answer. But honestly, the one who won was the one with the most stable geo services until something better came along. We were swapping out data sources and it was very much just what's publicly available, what can we consume easily. And I think that that theme carries through a lot of our data products. We find that some of USGS's most used products are the ones that we provide the best, most stable access to. So this is sort of a call to action to the geospatial community on the phone here, that, that this is a really key point in getting that actionable data to those decision makers. Whether or not it's the authoritative source, the best source, or the best source for you, um, there is sort of a mechanics at play in a lot of the data distribution. So um, I'm going to let Chris, if you flip to the next slide, uh, talk for a second about sort of what the USGS does and how we deliver data for our decision makers. Sure, thanks Marie, and hello everyone. Appreciate the opportunity to be part of the workshop today. So I'm in the National Geospatial Program at USGS, and I also support our geospatial information response team. We, uh, we focus on the geospatial aspect within the overall context of the USGS response. We do that for situational awareness, uh, to have timely data, and to provide some visualization uh, during the USGS response. So what you're looking at here is kind of a landing page that points to some of the events we supported over the last couple of years. You can see that quite a bit of that has been for inland flood and our coastal storm response team. The audience is primarily internal. It's our hazards executive committee, but we do support the Department of Interior and occasionally we have some uh, external um, information sharing as well. So if we go to the next slide, please. So this is the implementation of our coronavirus event support map. 
This is a screenshot from last week, and this is the operational view that, that we're using today that we've been using for about the last two and a half months. Um, the map there only consists of a handful of layers, but those were layers that helped start answering the questions that our management asked very early on um, in, the, in the second week of March or so. And that is, what are the case counts by state? What are those counts by county? And where are our facilities in relation to those affected areas? So some, some basic spatial analysis and situational awareness. Those seem like straightforward questions, but we had, we had quite a time in the data mining portion to get the right layers into the map. For example, our own facilities layer that we used was primarily for reference for, for other events, whether it be a flood or a hurricane. This was different, as Marie said, because every science center, every employee is now part of the event and that management is deciding when to close centers and now when to reopen those centers. So we needed a more robust layer and we found it by looking around and it turns out it was there. It was there at headquarters and it was updated every month. And in addition to a lat long for the building footprint, it also had uh, employee count. It had the region of USGS. It had the condition of the building. Other types of information that are very helpful for filtering the data to those who have to answer those questions. So it's a bit of a, a lesson learned um, in this response. Another layer that we dealt with was the COVID data itself. We found the Johns Hopkins data by state pretty early on. And along with that, we saw they were posting county level data. We said, that's great. That's, that's just what we need. But a couple of days later, the county data disappeared because it had been aggregated back to the state level. So we went on a search again and we ended up with the University of Virginia county level data. And probably for one to two weeks, we pulled that in. We used some Python scripting, pulled in the uh, common delimited data, and that was our source until we noticed that John Hopkins then went back to state and county data as a service, which really helped us out. And that's what we're using at this point. So if we go to the next slide, you'll see some of the specific pop-up information that goes along with the, uh, the map itself. So we ended up with centroid um, statistics for cases. We merged those with the census uh, boundary layer, and that just allows us to shade the map as we as we wanted to shade polygons and not use uh, just centroids for counties. But depending on who's using the data, you might be interested in look at the national view. Uh, you can filter by USGS region, or you can look at an individual science center and see what is the staff at this particular location and what's happening in the surrounding community as far as the case count. Now, since this has come online, couple months ago, there's certainly a lot more sources. As Marie mentioned, the GeoHealth is one of the big ones for us. And in that case, we point directly to them. For example, the hotspot uh, dashboard that they produce was requested. So we point directly from our application to theirs rather than trying to, to reinvent it ourselves. So this is just a look in um, to some of the things we're doing. And now that the focus has turned back towards when centers reopen, uh, we're dealing with data and decisions that, that, uh, that go into that. And I'll turn it back over to Marie uh, because she is in the midst of dealing with all that data and, and how to make those decisions. So Marie. Yeah, thanks, Chris. And if you could go to the next slide, Eric. Um, just real briefly sort of how do we move forward and I think some of the earlier panelists touched upon this too. Um, as part of the White House reopening plan they have these gating criteria and I listed one here on the slide verbatim. Uh, where do I find the downward trajectory of positive tests as a percent of total tests within a 14-day period with a flat or increasing volume of tests data? And, and that is just a lot to unpack. And, and, and decisions are supposed to be made on these types of sentences, the sentence structure, but the data that it takes to come into that is very complex. And we've had our data scientists, both at um, USGS and the department, putting these information together to try to make informed decisions, and it is incredibly challenging. 
it's more challenging than we've done in, in other types of hazard events. Um, for example, the, the graphs here on the, on the left is part of a COVID catchment analysis that the Business Integration Office put together for Park Service, looking at sort of how, do, how does a park that's located, say, in Colorado, but going to have visitors from all the surrounding states kind of try to digest this type of information? And the answer is, it, it, it is incredible. There is no answer. I mean, in the three graphs that are supposed to pertain to this particular border state trend, et cetera, they have an up and a down. So it makes it very difficult to make these types of decisions. And I think that this is the exact spot that we're all struggling with. So I think the, the, the lesson and message that I want to take out of this here is that, um, is that these authoritative data sets are critical and that when we put out plans or processes for emergency managers or any sort of decision maker to really make decisions about either geospatial or otherwise to couple that publicly available data to that decision. And I think that this is a lesson learned for all of us. We make our earthquake data available and, and it's something that I think that we're all struggling on in the pandemic world. And, and I think a part of the reality is that this is going to go on long enough that we may have some time to fix some of these uh, larger problems. I'm not saying, I, I, in this case, we are a user of the data. I don't have any answers in particular. So um, with that, I think I'll end there. And uh, I think we're holding questions to the end, correct, Harvey? So thanks. Yes, that is correct. We'll hold questions till the end. And unless there's anything particularly burning, let me just check real quick. Um, no, I think we can. We'll we'll wait for the for the for the end of the session. Okay, thank you very much, very much, Maria and Chris. Our next speaker is uh, Chawei Phil Yang. He is professor of geographical information science at George Mason University. His research research focuses on identifying and utilizing spatial temporal principles and patterns to optimize computing facility to facilitate science scientific discovery and engineering development. His research is further consolidated through his $40 million plus in research funding, 300 plus scientific publications and 15 plus faculty placed. He is also the founding director of the NSF Spatial Temporal Innovation Center, a collaboration among George Mason University, Harvard and University of California, Santa Barbara to build national and international spatial temporal infra infra infrastructure to advance human intelligence through spatial temporal thinking, computer software and tools through, through spatial temporal computing, and human capability of responding to deep scientific questions and grand engineering challenges through spatial temporal applications. Phil, please, the floor is yours. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so as uh, Harvard uh, introduced, I will report some of our research conducted in the NSF Spatial Temporal Innovation Center with a big team here. And it's many on the spatial temporal patterns and simulations uh, for uh, fighting against the COVID-19. There's a link here, it's covid-19.stcenter.net. All the data sets that I'm using uh, in this presentation or report uh, is uh, available over there um, and has a link to the GitHub connection or the Harvard Dataverse. And those data sets are collected by the team in the past about uh, five months. Uh, it has very detailed uh, case numbers for all the countries, including many different sources. We went to the authoritative uh, sources from uh, each country like Brazil and India and African countries to collect those data sets. There are also policy stringency index data sets that some of them we build for every state, for example, for the United States and also environmental data sets. So I will not talk details about those data sets. Let's see what we could do to um, using those data sets. And we know that COVID-19 is a dilemma and has a lot of challenges. It's moving very fast. Uh, one day we think we understand it well, tomorrow it's changing. And so there's a lot of questions to be answered. I just list a few of them. For example, how is the pandemic spreading? And could the climate control infection, uh, in fact, uh, control the infection speed to, so we could slow it down during the summer timeframe? Or is the pandemic biased 
uh, based on different races and different age groups and gender. And also we have a lot of uh, policies in place from different states, different countries, different counties, and are those working? And after a certain period, um, we have a lot of uh, demands for medical resources, but do we have enough? And how the sense is evolving from uh, both a geographical and a, a temporal uh, evolution aspect. And also uh, as we are in this scheme now, are we ready to open for economy? Or more uh, focused to us in academia is could we have in-person for semester? Uh, these are all the questions we want to have answer for. And at the end, I will uh, introduce my thoughts about the geospatial needs towards a solution for the resilience of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so first, uh, the dilemma that uh, will this happen early this, this year or end of last year in Wuhan. And at that time, we go to calculate the R0 skills. Uh, this is uh, almost everyone mentioned this number. Uh, at the beginning, we think uh, we have a good understanding. It's about 2 to 2.5 based on the early confirmed cases in China. Uh, but after we have more data sets coming in around about April to May timeframe, uh, CDC had a publication recalculate the R0 scores, the medium they found by that time is about 5.7. It's now about three times uh, of the original 2.0 to 2.5 uh, R0 uh, we thought it should be. And there are more research, in, in fact, discussions um, by saying that R0 sometimes it gets to 10. That's really bad. And when we look at this uh, from the beginning, people think, oh, it's just a flu. We don't have to worry about it. And uh, using the uh, England and Wales data sets, this is from the BBC. They said uh, they found out by the end of March, the COVID-19 is much more deadly than the flu and the pneumonia in the 2020 uh, flu season, as you see from this figure. And as of now, we know more about the pandemic. Um, the death rates uh, is also very different from country to country. The worst, for example, in Europe, uh, in Belgium, it's about 16% uh, death rate. And the UK has about 15, 14, 15. And France has about 15. And in the US, uh, we were at 6%. As I checked yesterday, it's like 5.5%. Um, that's similar to what China uh, has. So it's really very dynamic. It's not an absolute answer that we could have. Uh, it's a dilemma. And we have to answer many questions that impact our lives. So when we come back to see how the pandemic spreaded, uh, we know that early January, it only happened in China and then it spread it out into other countries through flights and other transportation. And when we get to end of February, uh, many countries, almost half uh, or one third of the countries around the world had uh, the uh, COVID-19. And when we get to April timeframe, uh, Europe and us here in the United States become the epicenter. Now we still have a lot and we have more joining Brazil, India and United States and also Russia uh, becomes the, the epicenter and with the most confirmed numbers. And this data sets again, uh, you can access from here. And I will share my slides uh, uh, as I signed the, the form. And so when we look, come back to look at more closely to the United States, so how did the uh, pandemic spread in here at home? At the early stage, we have only a few cases in Seattle, uh, but when we get to end of February, there's many cases in California. So California by that time start to uh, put into some policy in place. And then when we get to March timeframe, this gets really bad uh, when the White House take it seriously at the end of March. And when we get to April timeframe or now May and June timeframe, it's getting really worse. And we're gonna see that uh, from a different uh, figure. And so how a lot of question we wanna ask is with the pandemic going on and also all the policies in place, how has the environment been changed? For example, the air quality. And we took a look at the California, uh, several counties. Unfortunately, we don't have the data sets for every county. Uh, 
uh, we have some of the data sets. So if you look at the carbon oxide, um, um, oxide and um, uh, nitrogen dioxide and sulfur oxide, uh, these three figures, you see that the orange ones are the six year average and the 2020 data are those blue ones. You see that uh, we have a big drop uh, in these different uh, counties. But on the other side for PM10 data sets, uh, we have a big increase, especially in May time frame. Uh, that's because the CO2, NO2, and SO2 are mainly contributed by the, uh, the cars and the transportation system and the industry usage uh, of the coal and other uh, materials. But the PM10, uh, they have a lot of contribution from dust or wildfire and others. So the pandemic is changing the environment and the air quality has also been changed. So a lot of questions we wanna ask, and uh, we know that a few panelists in the morning uh, of the previous one has already talked about the climate could help control the spread. Uh, if, if we look at the early data sets, so this is um, the January and February data sets. If you look at those from China, different cities and including several uh, like Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, uh, Taiwan, and in addition to mainland China and Thailand, and you see that uh, the absolutely humidity and the temperature does have some kind of influence to the R0 values. And as we see here, but it's not very, we can see that high temperature will have a lower R0. Uh, we cannot see very near here. For example, here we have uh, Hyeongjiang here, Jinin, which are the coldest place in China, but their R0 is like 3.0, uh, but versus like Yunnan and Thailand, uh, those are hot places uh, in the in our winter time. Uh, from, oh, and, and their temperature is, is high in fact, but their R0 value by that time is quite low. And when we get more data into the June and May time frame. if you look at how the temperature plays here, uh, just look at these different countries, Brazil, uh, India, Russia. Russia's temperature is definitely increasing when we get into the June time frame. And this, in fact, if you look at the gray line here, the daily confirmed cases is increasing and then it's flattened out. And for the India case, their temperature is also increasing, but their temperature is already high by itself. So if you look at the um, orange, uh, the yellow uh, color, it's increasing. So that means the temperature probably didn't play a big role here that is able to control the spreading of the virus. So a lot of question we wanna ask, is the pandemic best? Uh, we took a look at the data sets uh, published by some states. Again, we don't have the data sets from every state, uh, which is the death uh, numbers of every state and also by the um, racist background. And if we look at this, uh, we can see that the Hispanic or African-American were hit the most here. So it is, uh, but what's the reason behind it? There's a lot of research ongoing. For example, a further study we found out that the low income and the living environment really impact a lot in this case. So another question we wanna ask with so many policies and administrative measures in place, is it safe to reopen now? Uh, we know that for example, this is the stringency index, which means the higher stringency index means more strict uh, restrictions for the movement of people. And in China, they applied from the end of January, create strict rules, so they could push down. In fact, they have about 14 days of uh, uh, the like for that. But after that, their reporting numbers is very low. Uh, we know now they have some uh, research in Beijing in the past few days. Uh, but even since they have this down there, their stringency index is still pretty tight, as we see here. And versus that, if we look at other countries, for example, India, uh, they applied very strict rules by end of March and began to loosen that by the end of April. And we do see by this time that uh, we would expect a 
exponential growth, but it was flattened here. Um, and after they loosened the street, and it started climbing a lot, uh, the cases. So you can see the correlation here. The policy did work to some degree, but is it safe to reopen? Uh, probably not yet. And if we take a close look in the United States at uh, different states, uh, for example, uh, Florida and Texas, if we look at uh, Florida, and they started to put in place the policies at the end of March and start to lo loosen that by the mid-April time frame and begin uh, towards this turn. Uh, and you can see that probably this is the reason why the numbers confirmed cases are a lot controlled. In fact, it's seen an increase in trajectory. And as of yesterday, they had the historical daily new confirmed cases. And uh, if you look at uh, Texas, uh, it's about the same time they put the policy in place and then they start to lower down the restrictions by the early May time frame and begin to lower even down by the end of May time frame. And that's probably speaks why it's also increasing trajectory in terms for Texas. So for every state, as we see from here, uh, in fact, um, they reopened it too early. That's not working good. Uh, on the other side, if you look at uh, the case for New York, uh, they always had these strict policies in place and they have a fixed reopen and their any report new cases is well controlled. So another question we wanna have is, do we have enough medical resources? And we collect these data sets on a daily basis and it's available, uh, the dashboard is based on ArcGIS and the data sets and some of our development. So what we did is that we take a look at how many people do we need to uh, have the hospital, uh, the beds for them, and how many beds do we have for dealing with contagious disease and also critical uh, staff uh, for supporting them. And the bigger proportional circles, that means the more resource we need or the, the less efficiency with we have the more deficiency we have over there. So from the April timeframe, we have some here. And when we get to May timeframe, uh, we have several places jumped up who needs more medical resources. So when we get to June timeframe now, we have more places jumped up. And with the summer going, if we have more cases or the second wave of outbreak, um, it's for sure that the medical resource will be in big uh, deficiency. So another question more important to us is that could we have an in-person fourth semester? Uh, I know this morning, uh, both Josh and others, um, uh, like Xiang introduced the ABM. And this is a work that we adopted an ABM model and building some of the um, criteria into here, just dropping one or a few infected cases and putting about 4,000 people here and how long it will take for everybody to be uh, infected. So if we don't apply any constraints on campus, uh, this is going to be the case. So it's quickly that a lot of people will become infected. And if we keep the six feet social distance, uh, this one will be much more slower. And if we keep the six feet and also 36 feet uh, as a requirement, for example, for our classrooms, uh, for example, the classroom used to be able to hold 100 people. Now we reduce that to 15 people. So everyone gets to about 36 feet, uh, square feet uh, space. So this will be much better controlled. So these, these are to these three lines. If we don't have any control, just let the campus open, it will be like this. And if we have some restrictions, it will be like this one. And if we apply more strict, it's gonna be like this. And we are still working on this, uh, try to add more criteria to see how could we open and what's the best way to make it open. But as long as we open, we have risks uh, over there. And if we want really control this, we need to really cut track who come to campus with virus and who he or she has been contact with.
So as a summary, uh, I want to report what kind of geospatial uh, cyber infrastructure needs, because uh, that's what uh, Harvard and, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the committee asked me to answer. So obviously, the first is that the transparency is something we need to look at from the geography set, and which means if we want to control this, we really need access to the personal or community reachable uh, data sets and mechanism. But we know that there's, there's uh, privacy issues. So how to balance the transparency and the privacy issues uh, is the key. Now, another one is data quality. And uh, we heard that from the previous presentation, uh, a reliable global distributed data collection and validation uh, system is key, both physical and social. Uh, so which means that we need a lot of people help us validate the data sets. For example, when we collected the data sets yesterday, where well, we look at a few countries, the change of data sets for the past week. So we have to update those. And also uh, the decision makers, and we hope that everyone could have a geographical thinking or spatial temporal thinking. Uh, and also when they do the reasoning, the decision, they come scientifically based and factual based instead of just from their mind. And also it's a cross domain, as you see, in fact, every figure I show here uh, has a team of different background of people working together to put that in place. And also we need to deal with the diversity, uh, especially for the best part um, to across, for example, to, to deal with the global situation, we need almost people in every time zone and also every, uh, both gender and different races and cultural backgrounds to help us and also, the most important of all is really we need a collaboration spirit uh, across the domain states and countries. And there are some references which details uh, what I uh, reported today. And uh, this is supported by NSF and also in collaboration with Harvard and our members of the center. And thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, Again, we'll hold the questions to the end just to make sure we keep on schedule. So our next speaker is Elizabeth Root. She's a professor with a joint appointment in the Department of Geography and Division of Epidemiology at The Ohio State University. She, she is also a faculty affiliate of the Translational Data Analytics Institute and serves on the leadership team for the Institute of Population Research. Dr. Root is a health geographer whose research focuses on evaluating place-based health interventions using geospatial analysis, geographic information systems, and large administrative data sources. Dr. Root actively engages with local and state government, including the Ohio Departments of Health, Medicaid, and Mental Health and Addiction Services, to explore ways in which state data resource can more, most effectively be used to inform policy and target health programs. Most recently, she began working with Innovate Ohio to build a multi-agency platform which integrates administrative data sources from health, education, public safety, and the judicial system. This big data resource is assisting the state in monitoring and surveillance of the COVID-19 pandemic and being used to address other ongoing public health crises such as the opioid epidemic and racial disparities. This effort involved from the Healing Community Study, an approximately $70 million a uh, research effort funded by the National Institutes of Drug Abuse to reduce opioid deaths by 40% over three years in 18 counties in Ohio. Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Thank you, Harvey. Um, so the, what I'm gonna talk about today is actually contact tracing um, and how we um, trace COVID cases through the population to hopefully um, put a stop to the epidemic um, as it grows and spreads through the population. And I've, I've actually been embedded with the Ohio Department of Health um, for the last three months. Um, I sit as part of the data team. Um, and I've been privy to a lot of discussions at, um, as the state grapples with a lot of the, the conversations that we've already had in this panel. Um, what data is out there? Which one do we use? What do we choose? What the world do we make of the White House grading, uh, gating criteria? And I've one of the most intractable problems that the state's been grappling with is actually around contact tracing. So for those, uh, sorry, next slide. I forgot I'm not controlling my own slides. So for those folks who aren't familiar with the basics, essentially contact tracing, we've heard a lot about it in the news. 
but it's a process where you trace and monitor the contacts of people who've been infected with COVID in order to control the spread of disease. And so essentially what happens in, in, in sort of the real world is that a person is identified through testing um, as COVID positive, and um, that has been a challenge in many states is, is actually identifying COVID positive patients. We know, we know we're missing a lot. Um, and so first you need to identify an infected individual. And then typically you use some form of essentially social network analysis whereby you ask that individual about their social net networks and construct um, a disease network for an investigation. And then contact tracers will then contact the contacts of that infected individual and ask a series of questions and tell them to either quarantine or stay at home or go get tested. Um, and in that way, you box in the disease, right? So you basically cut off these, um, these networks quickly and efficiently so that it doesn't spread any further. So clearly this is very challenging because you have to remember, you have to um, do a very good social network interview, which is um, a pretty challenging process actually. Next slide. So the interesting thing about contact tracing is that much of what we know and what we've developed about contact tracing comes from the HIV epidemic. Contact tracing is actually a fairly new um, public health, uh, sort of a structure in public health science. And um, many of the diseases it was initially uh, created to uh, look at or to stop were related, uh, were, were spread through things like se sexual networks. And so there was a physical contact and a social uh, relationship that existed. So it was easy to do that form of contact tracing that, that really relies on social networks. And so as we uh, face the COVID crisis, the question is what if a disease is not transmitted through personal contacts, right? So a disease is spread through airborne transmission or contaminated inanimate objects like doorknobs or, um, or something of that sort. So how do you then do contact tracing and how do we restructure the way that we do contact tracing um, in light of something that's a very different mode of transmission? And I'm sure um, some folks on the seminar have uh, seen the, the latest uh, research that just came out about two days ago, which sort of confirms that a lot of transmission is likely airborne transmission. Um, we, we thought that was true, but there was a really good piece of science that was just, just published on that. And so what this means is that we need to know where a person went, not just who they interacted with. And so there's this really deep need to incorporate geographical, geographical contacts into social network analysis and to that contact tracing in order to adequately contact trace for something that's spread through airborne or contaminated objects. Next slide. The other issue, of course, is that mobility plays a very key role in disease transmission, as many of the other speakers have, um, have shown, and how this particular, uh, this is a study that was done um, looking at transmission between Wuhan, China, and Singapore is that transmission occurs when you have an individual who is ill, who comes and introduces it into a new population. And so this particular transmission chain that was mapped um, was actually linked to an imported case from Wuhan, China. And that person um, visited, one of those people visited a church um, and then that person visited a family gathering and then somebody from that family gathering um, went to another church. Right. And so it is spread through the social networks, right, because this individual had a social network that was church related. Another one had a social network that was related to the family gathering. But there's also a mobility and, um, and a diffusion process that occurs between social networks. And some of that is related to location, like a church or a family gathering. And so the spread of the disease, especially with something like COVID-19, is through co-location in space not just through social network or some form of other um, network contact. Next slide. So there was actually a really interesting study of this done. There's not much research on this sort of social spatial or social geographical networks, um, partially because it's quite hard to do, but there was a case study that was done on the first SARS, not SARS-CoV-2, but the, the, the original one that, that was like 20, 15, 2016, no, it was earlier than that. It was the early 2000s, um, where they actually looked at personal contacts and geographic contacts. 
So when they found these um, SARS positive individuals, they went and said, okay, what was your social network? What did it look like? Who did you interact with? And then on the flip side, they said also, could you name all of the places that you visited while, while uh, you know, prior to us identifying that you were sick? And so what happened was when they added those geographical contexts to um, the social contacts, it actually increased these networks by which the disease could spread like a hundredfold. And one of their social network, actually social spatial network analyses is actually shown in this graph on the, on the right-hand side, where you can see that there's areas or hospitals where transmission occurred. And then there's people that were in those locations um, who also interacted um, and, and had their own social networks. So what this study confirms is that including geographical locations as nodes on a social network um, allows you to do a couple of things as you're trying to understand the transmission of the disease, or even as you're trying to figure out how do I do effective contact tracing. It allows you to visualize the role that location plays in disease transmission. It allows you to reveal a, a potential bridges among geographical locations or among different social networks. And then it shows you how the disease jumps into social networks, into new social networks, so that you, um, you can understand how the disease may be spreading um, from one unrelated social network to another unrelated social network. Next slide. So the issue with, with contact tracing, as we look at a graph like that, is that manual contact tracing, which is what many of our states and local governments are doing, is extraordinarily labor intensive. So for highly contagious diseases, um, there's an estimate that we need about one contact tracer per 1,000 population, which would mean in the United States, we need somewhere in the order of 300,000 contact tracers in order to effectively trace all of the individual's no networks um, who are known COVID positive patients. Um, it's also manual contact tracing is really less effective with a disease that has a very high asymptomatic rate um, or a long presymptomatic period. And unfortunately, COVID-19 seems to have both of those characteristics. There's um, a wide range of estimates about what the asymptomatic rate is, but it's, you know, most folks have settled somewhere in the order of 20 to 30% of all cases are asymptomatic. Um, and, and it does have a fairly long presymptomatic period up to potentially two weeks, although the average or the median seems to be around five to six days. So when you have that, if, if you haven't identified that an individual is sick, then clearly the contact tracing where you go out and you ask those social networks, you know, are you sick and all of that, that, that part doesn't happen. And so the asymptomatic spread does not, does not stop. So the other thing about manual contact tracing is that effectively tracing geographic or place-based contacts is actually very, very challenging. Um, if you think um, that contact tracing involves um, a person on the phone calling you and asking you a series of questions, it's quite often easier to say, well, these are the people that I've interacted with heavily over the last two or three days. You know, I can say I've interacted with my husband and I've seen this person and I've seen my children. But what I can't necessarily do is name all of the places that I've passed through, not just where I've been, but the places that I've passed through too. Um, especially people who are, are more mobile during their day. And so the question is, how do contact tracers who are doing that interview figure out who else was, was in a location when you were there? Um, because you may be able to say, hey, I was at um, this office building for two hours. And then is the, the contract tracer should then ask you a follow-up question of, well, do you know who else was there? But that process of then contacting those people is, is a very, very challenging process. So you can see why it might take so many individuals to do effective contact tracing, especially if you need to add in this geographic component that we know is important with um, COVID-19. So one of the proposals that's been on the table is that um, we should invest in digital contact tracing as a way of automating the collection of this contact data using some form of smartphone application. So if you go to the next slide, what this involves, um, and there are a lot of different uh, models out there, but it basically a phone typically sends out regular Bluetooth pings to nearby devices. It's just part of the functionality unless you turn it off on your phone. 
And what these contact tracing applications do is if another phone stays within a six foot radius for 15 minutes, you can change that, but about 15 minutes, the phones exchange a code. Um, and that code gets stored somewhere in the cloud. And therefore, if a smartphone owner tests positive, they can put into their app that they've been tested positive and their app will send an alert to all the other devices that it exchanged codes with in the last two weeks. And then, then, then it could end there, right? You've given, you've empowered the individual to say, oh goodness, I've been potentially exposed. I'm gonna go get tested. But if allowed, health providers could actually access that contact log information and build that into the contact tracing network um, that they have. So this is, an, this is a clearly an uh, a extraordinarily good use of, of technology. And there's a couple of challenges to it though. Um, it, it is, while it is more effective for tracing these geographic contacts because it's literally sending out a ping if you're in geographic contact with somebody else, there, there are many players in the game right now. So the Ohio Department of Health that I'm working with, we've had no less than five separate entities contact us offering um, some form of a contact tracing software that we as a state could roll out to try to build into our contact tracing. And they all have strengths and, and weaknesses. Um, there's not a lot of transparency about how they're being built or what they're doing. Um, the other big one, of course, is that there's a tremendous amount of concern about privacy. Um, I, was in a, I was in the room with some of my colleagues um, and they said, this is way too big brother for most Ohioans. Um, and, and they did not believe that this technology would be widely accepted by the population of this state. Um, and I think the third concern with this technology is that especially in, um, in rural communities, I, I speak for Ohio here, we have a large Appalachian rural community in the south and southwest or southeast of our state. Um, cell phone connectivity is very spotty. Um, it, it pops in, it pops out. Um, there's huge swaths of territory where there's no there's really no um, signal at all. Um, people tend to turn off their Bluetooth um, in those regions. And so just geographic um, accessibility of these tools would be a challenge in many states as well. So while there's a lot of really inherent benefits and, and this technology could, could track geographic contacts extremely well if employed properly, um, it's a really challenging technology to roll out especially when you think about rolling out as a whole. So next slide. So this is um, actually was a science article that was published last month that looked at um, how this technology would work. And then and they were actually doing a study of how, quick, how much more quickly cases could be isolated and therefore we would see a decline in the epidemic faster, right? So, so you say subject A has COVID-19 infection, they don't have any symptoms, and they don't know they're, they're infected with COVID and they have their phone at their, they're at home. And of course at home, they have maybe a, a spouse or a partner and that person potentially gets infected. They then take the train to work the next day and they sit right next to person C and D. And that train ride is a half an hour. And so C and D in the app are coded as having been in geographic proximity. They go to their workplace and in their workplace, they have a pod of people that they work with, um, person E, F and G. And those people all are all exposed because they're in close proximity in that workplace. But H and I actually work on a different floor. They're still in the workplace, but they work on a different floor. And so the app actually does not include them um, necessarily in the contact tracing. And then that person goes home again. And this might be a typical day. The next day, that person wakes with, wakes with a fever. They report their symptoms. They get tested and they're found to be positive. And as soon as they tell their phone that they're positive, it sends an instant signal to person B, C, D, E, F, and G that says, hey, you've been exposed to somebody who's now COVID positive. Um, and then you could code it to say whatever you want, self-isolate for 14 days, please contact your local public health department. You should go to the testing facility and hey, here's a map that shows you where the closest testing facility is. Um, and then H and I maybe be advised that they might have been exposed but that there are a much lower risk. And so there wasn't as much of a concern. So it's clear from this diagram how, how much an app like this would benefit our understanding of contact tracing in the community and our ability to do it effectively. Next slide. The real challenge for this is that 
most polls in the United States and actually abroad now as well, have shown that there's fairly limited support for digital contact tracing in, an, in a large portion of the population. So this is a, um, a recent poll that was done by the Brookings Institute, and they asked people, what's the likelihood that you would download and use a contact tracing app if it was provided to you um, either by your state or some other entity? And what you can see here is that um, among all respondents, almost half said extremely unlikely or more than half said extremely unlikely or somewhat unlikely. Um, and that's a big proportion of the population. And of course, there's variation by race, um, there's variation by uh, age and by sex. But the take home message is, is that um, there would be a limited group of people that would likely use a contact tracing app. And you'd need about, um, there's a couple of studies out there that show between 50 and 60% of the population would have to actively use the, the app on a daily basis in order for it to really provide the data and information necessary for this, this to work at a population level. So next slide. So I think the question is, it's clear that understanding geographic mixing, right, and geographic proximity for a disease like COVID-19, because it has an airborne transmission mechanism, is really, really quite important. And that our traditional contact tracing methods that we've been using that were developed for HIV and other STDs is not a super effective way of pulling in that geographic perspective into the contact tracing and using it um, is, is a problem. Like we need to sort of reimagine the way that we do contact tracing to um, take into account mobility and geographic location. But the problem is, is that this, this digital, um, the promise of the digital app uh, has not become reality, and I'm not sure that it will at this point. Um, there have been widespread problems with adoption, effectiveness, and data privacy. These are a couple of headlines I pulled out of the news. Um, Utah's multi-million dollar contact tracing app still can't track person-to-person -person contacts, so that's a functionality issue. Utah um, Utah decided to go this route and, and have a go at, as a state of creating a contact tracing app. Um, coronavirus in Texas, there's been delays and privacy concerns that have slowed the effort um, to use digital contact tracing. And actually some of our European neighbors um, uh, actually did this. So the British Health Service uh, just got one up and running. Norway was one of the earlier adopters. Um, and several of them started the app and then suspended it because there's a lot of concerns around privacy and how the data are used and who gets to see the data. Um, and, and if uh, health departments can't use and see the data, is it, is it useful um, for stopping the spread of, of COVID? So um, the WHO director actually made this statement. He said, digital tools do not replace the human capacity needed to co do contact tracing. Um, and I think that if there had been um, sort of a an effort led by the CDC or some some federal entity to develop um, a solid contact tracing app that could have been rolled out um, across the United States, we might be in a different we might be in a different boat now. But because of the sort of wide variety of, of different um, products that were offered and the successes and the pluses and minuses of those, it's been a really challenging process. Um, and I'm 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 not sure I personally see the path forward yet. So I think I'll leave it there. Um, and I look forward to discussing or questions at the end of this particular portion of the panel. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth, terrific. Um, we'll move on to our final speaker before we have questions at the end. The final speaker is David Blazes. And he joined the Surveillance and Epidemiological Program at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in May 2016 after serving as a physician epidemiologist in the Navy. In his 21 year career, Navy career, he served as Director of Infectious Disease Research at Bethesda Naval Hospital, Department Head of Infectious Disease on the hospital ship USNS Comfort, and Director of the Emerging Infections Department at the Naval Research Unit 6 in Peru. His work there involved developing disease surveillance systems in, re in resource limited settings, working with local officials responding to outbreaks and characterizing several novel pathogens. After returning to Washington DC, he directed the Department of Defense's global disease surveillance effort and contributed to the department's global health security work. 
He served as chief advisor to the Navy Surgeon General on infectious disease, as well as on several national security staff interagency working groups, dealing with global health security and health diplomacy. His academic work has appeared in Science, Nature, and The Lancet, and he has recently edited a textbook on technological innovations in disease surveillance. He has pre previously served on the Institute of Medical excuse me, Institute of Medicine's Forum on Microbial Threats, the Infectious Disease Society of America's Global Public Health Committee, Pandemic and Influenza Task Force, and currently serves on the National Academy of Sciences Board on Health Science Policy. At the foundation, Bill Melinda Gates Foundation, David serves as a relationship manager for the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, who we heard from previously, and manages a portfolio of grants around the burden of disease modeling, geospatial mapping, and next generation genetic sequencing of pathogens with epidemic potential. David, please, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you very much for the invitation to, uh, to join your group and speak. Um, so, as you mentioned, I work at the, at the Gates Foundation, um, and in this unprecedented time, uh, we certainly are, are eager to, uh, to apply some of uh, the geospatial technologies that, that have already been discussed. Um, just for brief background, um, we've been able to commit $255 million to, uh, uh, to the COVID response. Um, a lot of these funds are directed toward diagnostics and therapeutics, as you might expect. Um, but we definitely invest in epidemiology and modeling, um, especially as it can inform um, our future investments, but also uh, hopefully those will be, those data and, and information will be used by others uh, to inform their own policies. Um, one disclaimer up front, I am not a geographer like, like many of you on, on the call, um, but I'm an active user of, of maps uh, for public health decision-making. And that's kind of what I'd like to talk about is how, um, how we can in improve the precision of our health um, decision-making. Um, I think uh, there's been a lot of progress in this space. Um, and I think the full potential has not been fully realized yet. And so in many ways, this is still aspirational, um, but I think we are getting there. And, and I think this outbreak is, or this pandemic is really demonstrating the potential, uh, potential power as, as many of the previous speakers have already talked about. Um, so go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so um, I, as you know, this is an unprecedented situation and um, something that none of us alive have really faced. And so many of us are learning as we go. Um, I think that a lot of the public health actions that we know and have, have been tried and true in the past are pretty blunt. And I think we've seen them, them work. Uh, in various settings, uh, but but as I mentioned, these are these are instruments that, that apply across a population, um, and there are obvious, obviously uh, bystander effects that are either social, economic, um, or on health systems, or all of the above. Um, so I think as we go forward, it's important to apply precision um, in this space, and I think geospatial mapping um, allows for that that uh, potential to improve precision. Um, I think the, the value here is that, that it can make our public health actions more efficient, uh, more cost-effective, and, and hopefully both um, in, in delivering uh, um, health improvements. Um, there are many ways to, to do this, um, it, some of which have already been mentioned, uh, including contact tracing and, and isolation and quarantine. I think the, the key is to pair, um, pair information as, at as precise a level as possible with accurate testing um, and access to control measures um, that, that can be precisely um, uh, delivered. Uh, this can be things such as, um, you know, hybrid response, um, uh, which can include all of these things. I think some of the things we're looking at at the foundation are how do we do, how do we target clinical trials? Um, you know, how do we know what the likely um, burden of disease will be in a country, um, it, whether it's in the United States or elsewhere, where a clinical trial can be done on a vaccine or a therapeutic. Um, similarly, I think we, we've all just seen some of the information um, out of Oxford recently about dexamethasone. How can we um, precisely uh, decide where to deliver that, that type of, of intervention? Um, if you go to the next slide. A lot of, um, a lot of what I'll present in the next few slides is uh, is based on some of my grantees and, and um, 
and so some some of whom are on this call. This is um, a, a couple maps that is generated from uh, Alex Vesmignani's group up at Northeastern University, and he has an agent-based model that um, essentially is trying to predict um, what the projected cumulative deaths are to COVID in both um, unmitigated and mitigated circumstances. And, and it's a great model and, and I think has a lot of potential. Um, my only point here is that um, uh, currently the model predicts at a countrywide level. And I think that it would be better to eventually project um, levels um, at a much more subnational or, or even higher resolution level uh, for public health action. So go to the next slide, please. I think um, this precision type of, of model has been pioneered by Simon Hay, who you've already heard of, um, from today, and his team at IHME. And you can see that the national level certainly gives some resolution, but if we can get to much more precise levels, um, we can make decisions uh, uh, of how to deploy vaccines or how to deploy therapeutics or, or diagnostics even. And so that, I think that paradigm is what we are aiming for um, in terms of precision public health. Uh, go to the next slide. Uh, there's a number of different data layers that can be added to these maps um, to improve their, their, uh, their accuracy. And this can include travel time, which you've, you've also heard about today. Um, many, many different epidemiologic factors can be added. Um, I think you heard about temperature and climate. Um, I, I think uh, PM 2.5 uh, and even uh, various other environmental, environmental risk factors can be added. Um, and this can be done either uh, to predict where outbreaks may occur or during outbreaks to, uh, to trace the spread and, and potential um, impact on, on various related uh, geographies. So go to the next slide. Go to the next slide, please. Yeah, um, oh, passed it. Go back one. Yeah, here. Um, I, I think that we've all known uh, or, or realized recently that there is an age um, uh, distribution of, of deaths in COVID and severe disease. And so I think recognizing how those, um, how populations are distributed around a country are important. Uh, this is a map uh, from uh, from Andy Tatum at WorldPop, and you can see the population pyramid up in the upper right corner, and then uh, the color of the map by uh, by subregion or, or subnational geographies uh, kind of lists the percent of, of people over 80, um, and obviously the, those populations would be a higher risk, so you might target those those uh, areas for for quicker intervention. Um, go to the next slide. Uh, another thing we are looking at at the foundation and elsewhere are, um, are not only COVID deaths, but also the impact on health systems and, and other illnesses. And I think we all know there are many other diseases that, that have potential impact. Uh, malaria is one of those, and uh, certainly having uh, an underlying understanding of where, um, where malaria occurs and, and uh, where the, the highest rates occur uh, can lead to understanding where we might uh, prioritize interventions going forward. Uh, obviously, with COVID, many of many of the uh, ACT and diagnostic um, uh, efforts have have been hampered. Uh, so, prioritizing where where those uh, might have most benefit would be valuable. Next slide. I think there are also a number of potential responses that that have already been implemented. Um, and so one of those is uh, access to water, sanitation, and hygiene. Um, you can also see here that, that um, knowing where those, um, those challenges are highest um, also makes, um, uh, makes targeting uh, potential places where interventions um, should be employed uh, is also important. So um, in, this, in this case, targeting places where, where WASH has less access um, would be important. Uh, for control of, of COVID and other diseases. Next slide. I think that's coming up. Uh, I think a number of people um, uh, had mentioned uh, various interventions. I think one that um, is consistently becoming um, uh, more recognized as, as uh, valuable is wearing a mask. And Facebook has done a number of uh, global surveys 
and I think this is another important layer to include in any mapping. Um, here we see that in, in the United States and places where uh, there, are, there are much more granular data, you can get to a subnational le level, uh, but elsewhere we have just national level data. And I think uh, improving that would certainly make, uh, make the implications uh, more robust. Go ahead to the next slide. I think another important um, component of response is access to a health facility. And uh, this is certainly of concern in many places um, of our key geographies in Africa um, and South Asia. And certainly if, um, if you do have access to, uh, to a facility, you can, you can get uh, diagnosed, you can get treatment where it's available, um, whether that's intensive care or hospitalization. Uh, oxygen or even dexamethasone given uh, the current recent data. Um, so in understanding where exactly a facility is and, and where you might need to supplement uh, the current facilities that exist is important. Next slide. I think testing is, a, is also another challenge uh, as we've seen in the United States and elsewhere. Um, access to testing is not universal. Um, and understanding where testing occurs is really important. I think each country has a, a, um, some understanding of where they have testing in place, um, but that, that data is not available on a global basis yet. I think um, uh, they're starting to pull this together in many places. IHME has done this for their models and, and many other uh, groups are doing this as well. Um, the goal being to increase testing in, in geographies such that contact tracing can occur. Next slide. And then I won't go into this too much. Um, I think mobility data is really important for a number of reasons. Uh, and, and obviously this data may be biased based on, uh, on smartphone access, um, but uh, I won't go into this because it's been covered, I think extensively already. So next slide. IHME has, uh, has looked at mobility from a number of sources. So Facebook um, data, Google data, Descartes data. There's a number of different providers that, that uh, um, have access to this types, these types of data. And uh, I think, again, getting more uh, and more granular is, is, would be more valuable to, to building these maps and then making public health decisions based on it. And then next slide. Uh, I put this up um, just out of um, interest. Um, it is, uh, I think this, this, this pandemic has demonstrated that there are a lot of new actors in the field. Um, Instagram appears to be one of those. They are calculating their own, um, are effective. And um, I put this up in a mapping meeting because they are doing it by geography, by, uh, by state. Uh, I think there are some methodologic issues um, that, that are not ideal in this, in this model itself, but it is important to note that they are categorizing it by geography. And I think eventually we could get to even more granular um, um, distribute or, or display of, of uh, key epidemiologic um, factors like, like are effective. And so I'll stop there and, and uh, hopefully this was interesting in, in, in how we're using data such as these to inform our, our policies. Okay, thank you, David. That was very interesting and very useful to see how this how this data is being used. Uh, we're actually at break time, but we'll take maybe five minutes for a couple of questions. And I also want to encourage the other panelists to look at the Q Q and A panel and directly answer some of the questions. Um, there are lots of questions, and we have we don't have enough time to get to all of them. I want to ask one that was originally directed to Maria, but I want to, I think it's a more general question. And the the questioner asks points out that the ESIP Federation Disaster Life Cycle Cluster, the All Hazards Consortium and the utility industry have worked together to improve the trust level of geospatial and other data sets. And they're doing this by assigning something called an operational readiness, readiness level to those data sets. So um, is the USGS taking similar steps to apply trust levels of geospatial data sets. And I want to open it up after Maria to the other panelists. Um, we've, we've heard a lot about the data coming in and these measures based on data. How, how do we trust and how do we, how do we measure the trust of, of these data? Because obviously it's very important. So we'll start with Maria. Yeah, thanks Harvey. And I'll say that I actually reached back to, um, to several people in my organization to get a rough answer to this question because I didn't know for all data sets. Um, so the, the short answer is no, we are not 
um, publishing this information with each data set, although I'm very interesting, interested in following up with Dave. So if you could reach out to me after, I think that'd be terrific on sort of how to connect these two groups together. Um, but we do work with several groups, especially across the interagency federal um, groups, especially like disasters.geoplatform.gov and the data.gov platforms, which do take some, some sort of general thing about who's authoritative here or there. Um, but this, this type of trusting your data is really, really critical. Um, and especially with something that's relatively new for a lot of us data consumers like pandemic information, uh, you know, information about floods or the weather or a lot of things that occur pretty regularly are a lot easier for us to tackle and, and suss out authoritative data sets. In this pandemic, I think um, there's a lot of noise and we've got to find that signal in there. Any, would other panelists like to comment on that? How do you, how do you, how do you know you can trust your data? Ooh. Yeah, Elizabeth, how about you? <laughs> Well, for us, it's actually in, in Ohio, it's actually been a process of um, working with our data for the last three months. Um, I think we're finally coming to some understanding of what our data is actually telling us and what the strengths and limitations of it are in the way that it's collected or the changes that occur every time our testing strategies change in the state. And so unfortunately, there's a, there is some aspect of just having to work with the data and observe it and understand what happens when policy changes or ways in which the data are uh, procured change. Um, there's not a great magic bullet, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, and, and it's been a long process where at least in Ohio, after three months, I think we're finally comfortable with the data that we have and we understand it a little better. Okay, Phil, do you trust your data? Um, yeah, just want to add to that. In fact, um, yeah, for today, I may say I trust my data. Tomorrow, when I look yeah. back, oh, wow, <laughs> problem came up. Absolutely, um, yeah. I agree with that. <laughs> so, yeah, it's um, it could be introduced by a volunteer who's typing, you know, an extra zero or two zeros after that. Or it could be that, uh, for example, even the government from different countries, um, their health uh, department, when they announce the data sets, after a few weeks say, oh, we need to revise that based on the new data coming in. Uh, so uh, we have some confidence, but I would not say 100% trust on that. Uh, the way to do that is that we do go back to look at the historic data sets. So we have people checking that. And also we check our data sets and others who are present in the data sets. For example, if I see that the curve I use today is different from the one from John. Uh, Johns Hopkins, maybe there's something mm -hmm. over there and we need to look into. David, yeah, so you, um, oh, it, sorry. It's, it's very dynamic. <laughs> yeah. So David, do you trust the data of your uh, funders, people receiving your funding? What can you say about that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So I, I think it is nice when uh, when two distinct data sets agree um, or, or conclusions can be drawn that, that are similar. Um, so I think it is important to, to um, uh, to, to triangulate um, across data sources. Um, I think that, uh, uh, you know, for instance, with contact tracing, it's nice to, to look at genetic sequence data um, from the pathogens and, and see if it, if it corresponds to what the contact tracing uh, allows. So. Okay, I think so, we'll have to, oh, I'm sorry. Go on, ahead, Maria. Harvey, actually, can I answer the second question? Because I think it actually pertains to this. Um, the second question, if you can repeat that question for the audience. Yeah, to answer. it's what are the good reasons for not making the data public? And I actually think that this has to do with data trust because in the USGS, we pretty much have two main reasons that we wouldn't make data public. We are a public service agency. We push everything possible out public. Um, one would be national security. We collect data that we straight up can't release. That one's kind of a given. Um, and two, the reason that we would delay releasing data is QAQC. And I think that that quality assurance step is something that we are all sort of rushing forward with with this pandemic. And I think that the press and many are rushing to publish things before they're peer reviewed. And I think that we commonly will hold data just to check it for a little bit before we're more confident in it to release it. And I think that that's really a critical step is to publish your QAQC information so then we can gain the confidence and the trust of our data sets. They're very intrinsically linked. Okay, thank you. 
I think we have to call it there because the next session's at four and I want to give everyone a chance to take a Zoom break. So um, we'll end it there. Thank you panelists for a very interesting session. Also, I encourage the panelists to respond directly in the Q&A um, window to the questions that have been, that have been raised. Um, so we'll quit now and we will gather again at four o'clock for the session on uh, spatial indicators of resilience and recovery. See you at four. Okay, everyone, welcome back. And we have our um, third session today and a third topic, which will be on spatial indicators of resilience and recovery. And Kathleen Stewart will be moderating that session. Kathleen. Great, thanks Harvey. Um, hi everyone, I'm Kathleen Stewart. I'm professor in geographical sciences and director of the Center for Geospatial Information Science at the University of Maryland. And I'm a member of the Mapping Science Committee. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today for our workshop and for uh, being with us for our third session, which is, as Harvey mentioned, Spatial Indicators of Resilience and Recovery. Um, so our first speaker in this session is Ed Parsons. Uh, and Ed is the geospatial technologist for Google with responsibility for evangelizing Google's mission to organize the world's information using geography. In this role, he maintains links with governments, universities, research and standards organizations, which are involved in the development of geospatial technology. Ed is a member of the board of directors of the Open Geospatial Consortium, and he was co-chair of the W3C OGC uh, Spatial Data on the Web Working Group. He also represents Google at the uh, MTEL committee of ETSI, developing geospatial solutions for emergency telecommunications. He's a visiting professor at University College London and has been an industry advisor to a number of international universities. Uh, Ed is based in Google's London office and anywhere else he can plug in his laptop. Um, Ed was the first chief technology officer in the 200 year old history of the Ordnance Survey and was instrumental in moving the focus of this organization from mapping to geographical information. He came to the Ordnance Survey from Autodesk, where he was an EMEA Applications Manager for the Geographical Information Systems Division. And he is a Fellow of the Royal Geographical Society, an Associate Fellow of the Royal Institute of Navigation, and a professional member of the British Computer Society. Uh, so Ed, we are ready for your talk. Thanks. Kathleen, thank you very much. And uh, actually, good evening here from London. It's the end of a rather cloudy, damp day, as perhaps you would expect. All the cliches are often very true. Um, <clears throat> my presentation is probably going to be a slightly different from those that you've seen earlier on uh, today. I'm looking at the use of geospatial technology as we move out of uh, this current outbreak potentially looking forward to other outbreaks, but also looking at the impact of geospatial technology in restarting economic activities. And doing that from the perspective of looking very carefully at the ethical considerations that arise from this use of geospatial technology that's going perhaps in a slightly different direction than previously. Before I start, something you'll be familiar with from a Google point of view, uh, if you can sort of conceptually agree to this uh, terms and conditions dialogue box, uh, the, the comments that I'm going to make during this presentation are my own. They're not those of Google or any other organization that I might represent. I'm not going to say anything particularly controversial, I think, um, but nevertheless, they are my own personal opinions. I'm sure we've all thought it's very strange. The last uh, few months, uh, we've been living on what felt like a, a science fiction film. This is uh, from the, the science fiction film 28 Days Later that was popular uh, a few years ago, a British film that uh, covered the impact of a, an, a, an outbreak of a very violent and fatal infectious disease in London. And often it felt like we were living uh, in this science fiction movie. Of course, being technologists and geographers, we all wanted to, to use data to try and improve uh, the 
handling of this outbreak from a from an operational point of view as well as a strategic one what do we do to help and i think most of us have probably been frustrated over the last but more importantly to allow national and local policymakers to make decisions there was a recognition i think uh, clearly that the commercial sector technology platform providers like google and microsoft and apple and, and facebook and twitter had some access to data sets that potentially could be useful um, and of course uh, we across the rest of the industry uh, worked on that problem very very quickly and produced um, what information that we thought would be initially useful and i'd just like to talk about some of the thinking behind creating some of these data sets and making them be publicly accessible because i think they then give us some indication of the direction of travel where we might be over the next months and years uh, where we've suddenly made access to this type of data and technology possible the first is uh, the creation of what we term community mobility reports this is an idea of of how people are traveling around the world and how do we present that information uh, in a way that is both beneficial and useful to policymakers, but also privacy protecting it's based on an inherent capability that we have with the mobile devices that we carry around with us today in our pockets and this is something i like to call uh, ambient location. It's that ability to always know where you are and the ability to share that information to uh, service providers or to other applications completely seamlessly with no particular effort on your behalf. So you are in effect collecting this information as you, you live your day-to-day -day lives. You collect this information often because it gives you a direct benefit. This is the local railway station uh, to me in southwest London. Actually, it looks pretty much like this now, uh, pretty much deserted, far fewer people using the trains than normal. But on a normal day, I would be able to pull out my phone and see represented on my phone exactly how busy the station was at any particular point in time compared to what I would expect on average. And that that data we uh, we have uh, been displaying on uh, people's mobile phones for information about all sorts of different locations, largely you know, public locations such as shopping malls or railway stations or airports. And it's been useful, but not particularly prominent. Of course, with the outbreak and the, the requirement, the need for government agencies to have this sort of mobility data, we worked on, okay, well, how can we make this information more available and accessible to people while maintaining uh, individuals' location privacy. And over the years, we've come up with a, a methodology uh, that uses differential privacy in simple terms, the, the application of noise, random noise, to people's spatio-temporal location to make sure that no individual can be located within the data set, but nevertheless, it provides a statistically meaningful uh, measure of how busy a particular location is. We could abstract that out in terms of space and time to provide graphs like this, as you may well have seen, uh, very much aggregated, but telling you how these different categories of land use have changed over time from a baseline that was in January of this year. And you can see here in Greater London, big reductions, uh, particularly uh, in terms of people using much less public transport. So the key concerns behind doing this from a privacy point of view were this was based on a function in Google Maps called location history that people needed to opt into. Uh, was it appropriate to use this data, even though potentially people were unaware of how this might be used for this particular uh, outbreak? How could we make sure that we avoided misleading insights? And I think it was a very uh, a prominent and useful point made earlier. Sometimes it's not appropriate to share data. For example, how busy is a hospital is not necessarily the sort of information you want nevertheless ne necessarily to share. What was the appropriate level of granularity, both in terms of space and time? who should have access to the information actually there's a, a mindset that we should make this available as broadly as possible and actually for how long should this data set be available it was created specifically to deal with the impact of this covid epidemic for public policy makers it's not something that we think should be there for always and uh, when the outbreak finally does disappear we will retire this product 
But that same data has also been exposed now more prominently uh, for people returning back to work. The new normal is going to be a, a, an environment where we're much less happy to be in contact with other people. So here are two examples of, of technology that we've just introduced in the last few weeks. One, crowdsourcing how crowded bus routes are. So as a passenger, you can say this particular bus is you know, slightly crowded or more crowded than it usually is. And that information is then shared with other uh, potential passengers. And also very focused on uh, transit stations and on public uh, subway systems where you know, there's going to be a huge kind of requirement to increase people's level of confidence uh, in terms of using these services, much of that driven by information. Now, Elizabeth did a really good job earlier on describing contact tracing or exposure notification as, as we prefer to call it. And there's a long history, well, in COVID-19 terms, a long history of doing this. Uh, at the very beginning of the year, uh, Singapore was perhaps one of the first countries to introduce an app uh, for doing the digital contact tracing that you've heard again, using that Bluetooth LE technology. And of course, uh, we worked very closely with our friends at uh, Apple to develop a framework to do this and to try to reach as broad a population of potential users as possible. You know, a key point uh, raised again, I think, uh, by, uh, by my colleagues earlier on is that this needs to be out there and being used by people uh, to have a degree of, of efficacy. So key points from a, a perspective of the technology and their privacy point of view from, from the joint Google Apple approach is that this needs to be an opt-in. It needs to be something that you can choose to use or not. No public identifiable information should be shared. So it makes use of anonymous IDs generated by the Bluetooth subsystem on your mobile phone. <clears throat> and really importantly, and perhaps a little bit surprisingly for this audience, no location data should be shared. And for many applications of the specific part of, of, of contact tracing or, or the ability to be able to notify that you've been close to someone who could have potential um, infection, you don't need to know where that actually occurred. So here's basically how the system works. Elizabeth covered this very, very well. Phones both generate and receive Bluetooth uh, um, identifier strings. They regenerate every 20, minute, every 20 minutes or so randomly. The key part of the, the Google Apple solution is that matching of different keys to infected and um, potential carriers is actually done on the phone itself. It's not carried out in the cloud anywhere, minimizing the, the risk of, of data being shared more broadly. Very important to focus on that privacy preserving part. As I said, there has to be explicit user consent. No location data is shared. Um, Positive results are not shared between Google or Apple. They only go to the public health agency that's been identified. And Google and Apple made a conscious decision only what to work with specific health agencies identified at a national or local basis. So you have to be whitelisted to make use of this functionality to build your app. And, and here are some examples of what those apps might look like. Okay. That's kind of covering the territory of what we've done up until this point in time. And I want to just kind of conclude by looking at where this might go forward from a, a point of view of, of the ethics of using this sort of information. Clearly, we have been living in an emergency situation. Uh, this is something that you know none of us really expected. And we've had to develop capabilities and functionalities that perhaps have surprised all of us. We've done things that perhaps we wouldn't normally have imagined doing. You know, no crisis is about choosing good solutions. It's also about choosing the worst, uh, the, it's about choosing the least worst solution. But in cases of emergency, what you do is you come to your emergency and you break the glass. You know, when you break the glass, you do things that perhaps you wouldn't normally do. And that's an appropriate uh, circumstance, having a protocol that you can then adopt when you're in an emergency situation makes a lot of sense. You do end up doing things you wouldn't normally do. But when you break glass, it stays broken. It's very easy for us to adopt processes or techniques that perhaps we might not want to see persisting. Uh, we may do things in, in the stress of dealing with a pandemic 
than actually uh, create foundations of an environment that we might not want moving forward. And let me just give you kind of two examples of, you know, I'm not going to be you know, explicitly criticizing these approaches. People take different approaches to dealing with uh, public health issues, but it's interesting to think about them. Uh, this is the uh, contact tracing app in India, and it's something that you actually have to, by law, install on your mobile device. There's no choice, there's no opt-in. Uh, the Indian government have made the choice that no, this is something that you should install. In Hong Kong, there's a very sophisticated contact tracing approach that makes use of lots of different types of, of hardware. It's not so completely reliant on a mobile phone. Uh, you also use just simple wristbands or wristbands with uh, additional RFID or Bluetooth sensors. This is of particular use when you have been quarantined. If you've been quarantined, you'll get a message uh, from your uh, health agency saying that you have been quarantine, quarantined, you're expected to stay at home. And as part of the process of being quarantined, you need to walk around your home so that your device, be it a mobile phone or one of these wristbands, will pick up all the RF signals in your particular house and will build a geofence of your particular property. So it knows the radio footprint of the property that you live within. Uh, if a change in that footprint is sensed by you leaving your property, you can then expect a rather nasty message telling you that, hey, we know you've left home, uh, you may well be prosecuted or you'll at least have a warrant uh, acted against you because you have broken your quarantine. So this is a use of, of geofencing technology to restrict people to a particular part of the, the planet. Now, you might argue under these circumstances, that's appropriate, uh, but it's a technology that once it's ro ro uh, rolled out in such a sense, it's there. So I think we have to be very cautious. Fortunately, I think we're beginning to have much broader conversations around these topics at this point in time. Uh, there's a number of um, activities afoot. I particularly point out the uh, Ethical Geo Organization, which is a, a part of the uh, Association of, uh, of American Geographers or the American Geographical Society uh, that is working on this. I originally blogged on this topic as well. Uh, I think it's really important for us as a, an industry and as a technology to start to think about the ethical implications of the technologies that potentially may be rolled out over the next few months with the best uh, insights and with the best uh, of society in, in policymakers' eyes, but we need to be wary of what the long-term implications of that technology might be. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. Uh, we're gonna be hanging on and hopefully to answering some questions at the end. And, and please feel free uh, to reach out to me either via email or, or via Twitter. Thank you very much. Super interesting, great. Thank you so much, Ed. Appreciated those uh, thoughts and information very much. Um, so, okay, well, let's save our questions to the end and we'll move on to our second speaker, um, who is someone I know from the University of Maryland. I'm very happy to introduce uh, Professor Lei Zhang. Uh, Lei Zhang is the Herbert Rabin Distinguished Professor of Civil Engineering and is director of the Maryland Transportation Institute at the University of Maryland uh, at uh, the College Park campus. Dr. Zhang's research focuses on innovative mobility solutions, travel behavior, smart cities, and decision support tools uh, driven by data, AI, and cloud computing. He leads several federally funded initiatives on leveraging mobile device and other emerging data sources for improved understanding of spatial behavior and modeling. Lay, look forward to your talk. Thank you, Kathleen. And if I could uh, have my slides up. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I wanna thank uh, Harvey, Kathleen, and uh, other organizers for uh, this uh, great virtual workshop. It's uh, my pleasure to be here to talk about some of the work at the Maryland Transportation Institute at University of Maryland on how we measure mobility, social distancing, and economic impact with anonymized uh, mobile device data. 
And I, I put our website up there uh, in case you have not visited it. I would encourage you to go to uh, data.covid.umd.edu, which is the place where we uh, give the general public access to computed measures on these specific factors. Uh, next slide, please. And, and this is what the uh, platform looks like. Uh, what we wanted to do is to really uh, compute a variety of different measures for decision support using mobile device data and other data sources all across the US. And, and, and honestly, this, uh, you know, we also caught a lot of media attention. I, I have to admit that uh, I never thought I would, you know, catch such media attention for discovering something that's fundamentally so basic that everybody knows, which is that people really do not like to stay at home for way too long. You know, that's, uh, uh, that, that's an interesting uh, behavior uh, discovery that we found early on after people staying at home for more than a month, they just decided that's too much and uh, they decided to go out. Uh, next slide, please. And we compute, you know, there were questions, uh, next slide, please. There were questions early on about how mobility and um, uh, social distancing and these factors could have computed from different kinds of data sources. And, and we certainly do that you know, as part of our platform like many others. So you know, we track our social distancing index which is based on the anonymized mobility behavior data. And we look at that at a state and a county level on a daily basis. Uh, so we, you know, you, you, if you go to the website, you can see you know, the holistic view of how social distancing has been evolving between January 1st this year until the most recent day which we have data. So, you know, that the clear thing is that the level of mobility and the level of social distancing really vary a lot from state to state, from county to county, from community to community. Next slide, please. And we also compete, we understand it's important for both the general public and also decision makers to not only be aware of the mobility trends, but also all the COVID public health related factors as well as economic indicators. So we also leverage our mobility data to compute uh, several different economic indicators, percentage of people actually working from home, number of workers actually working from home is uh, one of them. But we also look at changes in consumption based on the kind of data that Ad just showed you in terms of visits to consumption, different kinds of consumption sites. Uh, we also actually estimate job gain and job losses um, by economic sector at a county level using, you know, based on this kind of anonymized behavior data. Next, please. And, and at University of Maryland, we, you know, I consider ourselves uh, a leader in transportation and mobility data analysis. Uh, we didn't start doing this because of the pandemic. Uh, our cat lab, our Maryland, you know, which is our, you know, the uh, data center, affiliated with the Maryland Transport Institute. And we've been working with mobility data, transportation data from passive to collective sources for the past 20 years. At the beginning, we only get data from GPS devices embedded in vehicles or other uh, person wearable GPS devices or cell carrier data. More recently, you know, we, you know, starting about six, seven years ago, we started working with a mobile phone location-based service data from apps, from uh, different SDK units. And our platform right now uh, serve more than 12,000 public and the private sector data users uh, all across the US as well as uh, in, in Europe. Next slide, please. And the specific data I wanna actually dig a little bit deeper into on the next slide is uh, the primary data source we're using. And Ad did a great job talking about ethics and uh, privacy protection on this kind of data. And I want to dig a little bit deeper into what this kind of data looks like. And we all know these kind of mobile device location data, they are biased. We, number one, because the smartphone penetration is not representative of the general population. It's, naturally, it's biased toward or against uh, the uh, lower income and also uh, uh, older age groups. And even if we see a device in our sample, it doesn't mean we see the device every single day, like a longitude on a survey. Uh, even if we see a device on a particular day, we may not see the device in every single hour of that day. 
So there is a lot of a geospatial, temporal, socioeconomic biases in the data. How, you know, I, I, want, I do want to spend probably four or five minutes to talk about the kind of work we've done to help set a national standards for the quality of this kind of data. So we have more confidence in the results that we obtain from this kind of data. And, and by the way, we can also impute you know, all kinds of information from the data, not only where people go, uh, all, you know, with a not, you know, privacy protection, but also uh, how they go there, imputed travel modes, purposes of the visits, as well as the social demographics uh, in a way that also protects privacy. Next slide, please. Uh, there might be a delay. So uh, can we go to the next slide? Yeah, thank you. And, and so one thing we've been working on uh, in collaboration, you know, actually for uh, the US Department of Transportation is to work with them to try to, uh, you know, this work started about three years ago to set a raw data standards for mobile device data because of all the biases and all the issues with this kind of data. How can we be sure? And, and, and when, when researchers publish a paper using this kind of data, uh, they, they can also, they, they cannot share the actual data set they used. That also creates a problem. How can we replicate uh, the results if we cannot share the raw data because of privacy protection? Uh, what we see as a way to deal with this is to come up with a standard uh, quality metrics. And this is the place where I, I think geographers can help a lot. But we did look into the typical data quality standards like on a monthly basis how many devices we see, MAU, monthly active users, daily active users. But then we also develop some additional measures to look at a geographic representativeness of the data. Uh, do our data really cover all the different urban, rural, different areas equally or not? And to what extent do they cover different geographic areas uh, you know, in, in a way that's, that so the data is representative? And, and in terms of temporal consistency, and we, you know, if you look at a table, uh, you know, we cannot share the name of the actual original data provider. Uh, but as you know, there are many, many, uh, quite a few different data providers out there. If you measure these things for different data sets, uh, this is all for the U.S. And 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 you will see that they vary a lot. At what, but at least you know, this kind of information is something researchers and everybody can share, as we share the results. So we know the kind of data that went into producing these results. And going further, what we do is we don't rely on the data from just one data provider. Uh, we actually merge the data from multiple different data providers to create a raw data panel. And, and we set a data standards uh, as follows. And we said that when we merge the data, you know, this is a standard for data fusion and for merging data from different sources. The criteria we use uh, centers on the concept that the merged data set should be superior to any individual data set based on all data quality metrics. Uh, so, so that's the standard we set, which we believe it could be a good practice for, for data merging as researchers, practitioners, and decision makers start using this kind of data more and more as we see as a result of this pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the next issue is even if we have a high quality original data set to work with, uh, we still need to address a lot of issues with this kind of data for, you know, for geospatial analysis, uh, for economic analysis, and all kinds of decision support and research. And we need to uh, uh, identify trips and tools. And, and, and there are issues here. And how do you define a trip? We look at a ways commercial data providers do that. Uh, there are a lot of issues. You know, we, we often see that a trip that, you know, a single trip because of the tool and activity tool gets broken into multiple trips. If we just take the number of trips from these commercial data providers, then we will be either uh, significantly overestimate or in some cases underestimate number of trips. So we have to use a tool based approach. And, and there are also a lot of information that's not in the data that we need to impute. So we need to look at uh, travel modes, purpose, and distance, and just measure the distance of these trips because they're, you know, you know, for financial sector applications, there is a lot of interest in how far people travel. And just measuring that distance is actually not a trivial task. And then later on, we also need to uh, integrate mobility data with point of interest data, 
with all the economic data and, and all of that takes a lot of algorithms. And, and, and also finally, but you know, last but not least, uh, we need to weigh the data in ways that we can address hopefully all of the different kinds of biases, geospatial, temporal, and socioeconomic and penetration wise bias, uh, uh, biases. So, so we actually have developed a multi-level weighting to address all these different biases uh, you know, when, when we look at these kind of data. And then lastly, we need to also be able to calibrate and validate the results, which you know, is often missing uh, when we see some of these results. How, how do we actually validate the results we get from this kind of a large but biased uh, mobile device data? Uh, you know, I don't have time to go into details on these each individual algorithm, but what we hope is to find a way to work with the, old, you know, the entire community to be able to use our collective wisdom to improve the accuracy, reliability, and, and privacy protection of all these important algorithms uh, and, and be able to compare these algorithms developed by different sets of researchers and companies uh, together. I, I think we really need something similar to the image net for the AI community uh, in terms of the geospatial and transportation community as we use this kind of data. Uh, we need standard algorithms we need a standard data set that people, everybody can access securely without violating privacy protection so we can really collectively enhance these algorithms and enhance the science behind it. Uh, next slide. All right, uh, so now I wanna describe some uh, interesting use cases and some that probably have not been touched upon by uh, earlier uh, presenters. I wanna focus on these. At a federal level, you know, several federal agencies are using our data. Some of them are data we publish on the platform. Some are the data, you know, we customize and provide to them uh, through direct collaboration with them, and, you know, including Department of Transportation, CDC, Veterans Affairs. Uh, on, our, on our platform, we also uh, combine the health data, economic impact data, mobility data, vulnerable population data to provide society and economy reopening assessment, you know, a tool called Sara, our Veterans Affairs is actually using, using that to make their own reopening decisions. Uh, a lot of interest from the financial sector and Department of Treasury on using this kind of data to look at long-term economic projections and the different kinds of financial investment portfolio analysis as well. Uh, next slide. And, and, and as a transportation engineer by training, you know, we certainly look at different kinds of uh, travel behavior changes and this graph just shows the changes of number of very short distance trips and very long distance trips all across the nation in different months. And so, you know, you see the trends for all these different trips. You know, one thing that's interesting was that at the beginning of the pandemic, we actually saw a huge increase in long distance trips. And these are the people who were in a hurry to go home or to, uh, uh, you know, flee away from their home, which might be a hotspot at a time. Next slide. Uh, some other things that might be of interest to uh, geographers and others is in terms of activity, people's activity, participation, and time use changes. You know, we see a lot of these activity duration, activity participation, and time use changes also. Uh, here, I offer two examples on how people's arrival time, you know, how people's preference on when to go for shopping changed because of the pandemic, as well as this, the, the, the amount of time they spend in the stores when they do go there. Uh, they actually do spend longer time to go to the store. And now you see more people going to shopping sites earlier during the day rather than in the evening or late afternoon. But you can you know, look at these for all kinds of activities and time use patterns as well. Uh, next, please. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. And you know, other things that others already mentioned uh, from the uh, raw trip observations, we can aggregate things up to the origin destination level and be able to look at external trips. And when we look at external trips, and we, you know, this, this would re really allow epidemiologists to really trace the transmission of the viruses as people travel across the nation. So, so in a way, based on this kind of mobile device data and the algorithms for expanding the sample data to the population, we could actually create a digital twin of entire country in terms of the individual level, but anonymized individual level movements uh, to be able to actually trace out how, move, how mobility 
and uh, virus spread really occur across the nation and be able to publish that kind of results at the aggregate level. Uh, next slide actually shows one interesting, you know, county level example in Maryland. So in, in Maryland, there was a myth. Uh, one of our counties, which is where University of Maryland is located in, uh, is doing a great job on social distancing based on data, based on you know, observations. But somehow the Prince George's County is just getting a lot more new cases than the rest of the state. And then after we overlay the data on imported cases, these are our estimated number of uh, people who traveled to this particular county from the rest of the nation, from New York, from all the other places in the nation. And we found a very high correlation between these number of imported cases in Prince George's County. So in other counties, they got less. So that explained uh, in a way why they're still having a lot of new cases, even though they're doing a good job in terms of preventing community transmission of the viruses within that particular county. Uh, next slide. And I wanna also talk a bit about contact tracing and, and, so, and also uh, outbreak, outbreak, a new outbreak prediction, like pre based on visit data that Ad showed you and I'm, I'm showing you here as well. Uh, we can monitor all the visits, right, to all the different locations all across the country and maybe internationally as well. Uh, as long as we don't, we eliminate the point of interest that are getting too few visits, which would get into privacy protection concerns. You know, Google, you know, I see Google does that also. Sometimes they would just say we don't have enough data. Uh, we do the same thing. But the point is that on the next slide, you will see that we're able to look at uh, the level of social distancing and the level of crowdedness uh, at a point of interest level. So, so we're actually providing that uh, service uh, as, just as a pure service to different counties. Uh, in, this, in this particular case, for Baltimore County in Maryland, which also suffer from a lot of cases and new outbreaks, uh, we are helping them on a daily basis monitor the level of crowdedness at more than 6,000 uh, vulnerable locations. These are the locations they worry about every single day uh, to actually predict the risk of a new outbreak at every single location based on how many people go there and uh, the approximate location of where they come from and the level of infection rates or number of active cases at origin. So all of that play into this risk estimation at individual point of interest level. And that helped them understand, okay, today maybe we should go to these places to do more disinfection and allocate their limited resources uh, for COVID response. Uh, I don't have time to go through probably too many applications, maybe just one more uh, on the next slide on what we call a community level or aggregate level contact tracing. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. And so this idea comes from the observation from our data. You can see that on the platform as well. Uh, actually the slide number 16, the previous slide, please. Uh, maybe there is a delay, I think in what I see and uh, what the operator sees. And, other than two of the, U the states in the US, no other state has really enough number of contact tracing workers who can use a boots on the ground method to do individual level contact tracing. Uh, but by integrating this kind of mobility data and AI algorithms, what we can do is if, if a new outbreak happens at a supermarket, a church or a, a school, uh, within, within seconds, uh, by leveraging cloud computing, within seconds, we can give an area to local authorities and tell them that based on the aggregate level of mobility patterns, because of, you know, in order to contain this local outbreak, we suggest that you notify people uh, who are in this localized area to encourage them to self-quarantine or at least let them know they might be at risk. Uh, many, many days before they can complete contact tracing using the traditional uh, method. And you know, we, we see this as a good example of leveraging this kind of mobility data, uh, AI and computing while protecting individual level privacy to really help local and state jurisdiction uh, agencies to be able to better contain a local outbreak, a new outbreak. Uh, next slide. 
and we, we, we have also been doing work on really estimate the economic impact because by looking at how many people go to work previously and stopped going to work, which means they either are working from home or they lost their jobs. And we have developed methods to actually distinguish these two kinds, which would then allow us to look at how many people are working from home, how many people have lost jobs, what kind of jobs they had before. And now for the people who lost their jobs, uh, you know, all at an aggregate level, you know, we're look, not looking at individuals uh, at a county and state level, how they're adjusting, you know, are they, you know, are they getting new jobs at economy recovery? And so we can provide that kind of estimate at an aggregate county and state level based on mobility data uh, much, much faster than federal statistical agencies can provide based on their typical measurements. You know, their data is usually three months, maybe even six months, nine months late, but we could actually provide these estimates um, on a weekly basis. Um, and, and with that, I, I'm going to my last slide. I see Kathleen also, you know, already showing her face. I understand what that means. <laughs> uh, my last slide is just some research questions for, you know, for the community to, to, to ponder. Uh, you know, how, the first one is how can we best define mobility and spatial behavior indicators? Uh, I, I look at the way we define social distancing and others define, I, I think more work can be done to really measure close contacts, to measure social distancing, which then epidemiologists can use uh, for their models. And the second question has to do that uh, travel models in the past were done for long-term planning. Uh, we're looking at the, the normal day 20 years from now, uh, now with day-to-day -day observations of mobility data, uh, how can we really advance travel modeling using this kind of day-to-day -day observations uh, from a larger sample of the population? And, 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 I, I wanna, you know, and the, the third one has to do with uh, how, we, how we can work together to leverage the ability to measure a person level spatial behavior almost continuously for a very large sample of anonymized individual. I, I, every single day I worry because when my students work on this kind of data, I worry if they really fully understand privacy protection. So we took some very rigorous measures on pr uh, protecting privacy. The data always sit in a secure server in the cloud. There is no data on zip drive, on USB drive, on local computers, but I'm not sure if everybody, you know, we, we, we would do that. So this is really the ethics for protecting privacy because otherwise the entire community may lose access to this kind of data uh, if privacy protection, uh, you know, really is not observed by certain groups, then we are all losing access to the data. So the balance between privacy protection and being able to extract the research value and practical value out of this kind of data uh, is very important. So, so really look forward to you know, engaging and working with the community on uh, how we can ensure both privacy protection and responsible data use while we seek scientific discoveries together. And, and thank you again for your attention and look forward to uh, seeing what questions and comments uh, you may have today. Great, very nice, good. Thanks, Lei, for that. Uh, we are going to move to our final speaker in our session today on uh, Jonathan Sheff. Uh, Jonathan is a statistician at Transit App, a mobility as a service smartphone app. Uh, Jonathan trained in statistics within the fields of education and neuroscience, receiving his MED from Harvard University and MS from Vanderbilt. Within neuroscience, he used longitudinal MRI data from children to find neurobiological indicators of dyslexia in pre-readers. Since moving to Montreal with his wife, an epidemiology doctoral student at McGill, he has shifted towards data sets in public transportation. He uses transit app data as well as transit agency data to seek behavioral patterns of users and insights into equity and development. Jonathan is a mountaineer and a relative newcomer to geotemporal mapping. Hey everyone, thank you for attending and Kathleen and Harvey, thank you for hosting and to the rest of the Mapping Science Committee. Um, I'm really honored to be here. Simon, you said earlier that you're an imposter here. I feel like I'm an imposter squared maybe. Uh, my wife, the epidemiologist should maybe be doing this, but um, I'm, I'm excited to present to you uh, 
just the background I gave, uh, I do come to transportation and mapping from neuroscience. So there's a lot of uh, processes that we're building. And, and one thing I'm excited about from this workshop is the discussion after about uh, hearing from you and the other panelists about uh, what else is possible. Um, so we can go to the next slide, by the way, look at the outline. So I'll, I'll talk about the data sets that I'm using at Transit App, and um, I'll try to just generally talk about what is what are the data sets that we use in public transportation analysis in general. Um, also, one of those capabilities is user survey capabilities, which I think uh, haven't been touched on much. So I'll, I'll just mention those as a uh, part of the data we're now analyzing. And then I'll talk about the kind of location data we have and, and what we have done with it, but especially where we're going with it. Um, because I think overall uh, public transit data has been and can be a very strong indicator of um, many components of the flow through a pan pandemic. Uh, so next slide. So I'll, I'll just start by giving you an overview of the kinds of data that um, I'm working with. So from transit app, uh, I included a screenshot on the right, just uh, so you can see what kind of behaviors we're looking at. It's a it's a um, trip planning app. It uh, gives you real time ETAs for buses and trains. Um, you can do multimodal trips like bike share and ride share. So it's uh, it's measuring basically how people get from A to B. And so any of the behaviors that you're looking at in the app are things that we measure. So um, we, we do have, you know, a location and timestamp when people use the app. Um, we don't, we don't measure background location tracing like some apps. Um, I'm, I was really excited to hear about, uh, Ed's ideas on privacy. Those, those really mirrored a lot of our own, uh, user privacy is of core value at transit. So we, we don't do background tracing, but when the app is open, um, unless it's disabled, but uh, to plan trips. We have location data, we have trips data that are planned, um, or just if you interact with routes, if you tap on say route E, the blue line there, you can see a close up of the buses and, um, and where available, you'll have crowding data and um, things like that. So, and then uh, the other kind of data we have are preference data, like accessibility choices and uh, modes that are turned on and off, things like that. Yeah, next slide. So when, in, back in February, when uh, the spread of COVID was really uh, becoming a worldwide phenomenon, um, we built a model looking at transit demand um, in, well, all over the world. And so we're using uh, geography and time uh, to look at the, essentially the drop in use of public transit um, but this is this is based on data from our app. We don't we don't claim to have ridership. We we have usage of our app. Um, it turns out where available, um, ridership and our statistics correlated really well. So that was a nice uh, validation. And I think the other thing that worked out really well is that um, ridership data aren't frequently available on a daily or an hourly basis. Um, they're frequently published monthly and sometimes only quarterly. So it was nice to have this uh, real-time measure of public transit demand from our data that um, spanned across many different regions. So having the same source for multiple regions was what I found really valuable about this data set. Um, and then, oh yeah, and. and this isn't just about transit app, you know, in public transit in general, um, agencies are collecting similar kinds of data. They'll have ridership data from um, automated counters on vehicles or station data, ticket, ticketing data, things like that. Um, and again, there can often be a delay on that kind of, those kind of data. Um, next slide. Great, so here we're looking at the hourly breakdown over the course of a day. Um, I chose a day before COVID, uh, the 13th of January. Uh, that's the top like green line. I chose a day sort of peak drop in COVID. No, that's a bad way to say that. 
when, <laughs> when, when people were riding public transportation the least in the middle of the COVID pandemic, uh, 15th of April, and then now, which is the middle dark green line. And it was interesting to see a lot of uh, the temporal patterns shift during COVID. So the, again, the top line was essentially a normal Monday um, and you can see the rush hour peaks. During COVID, that bottom line, the peaks really disappeared in many cities across the country, or if they didn't disappear, they flattened and, and shifted. Um, and that was, there's a really interesting uh, way to observe a shift in behavior of people using public transportation. And, um, and all of this ties to uh, policy. It was a way to look at how people react to policies in their regions. So when stay at home orders were put in place, we could see these behavioral shifts uh, occur and, and how much they occurred. So, um, you know, getting back to the geographical data, we saw that there was a slower response in uh, a lot of southern cities and Midwest cities than uh, on the West Coast and in the Northeast. Um, next slide. Okay, so I thought I'd, I'd talk a little bit about user survey capabilities because it's an interesting part of our data. Um, you can go to the next slide. In April, we um, we ran a survey, I mean, internationally, but in, in, in the US after cleaning, there's 15,000 respondents, 10,000 in Canada. And th this is very much a phase one kind of survey where we were curious who was writing. We asked about transit uh, usage and frequency and, and um, some basic demographics. Uh, next slide. So here you can see some of the regions, uh, the, the primary regions of the responses from the survey. And I'll, I'll talk about some of the results there just so you get a sense of um, our, our data. So next slide. So for example, we saw during COVID a shift towards being the uh, user base and uh, presumably the rider base then being um, disproportionately female than before. So this top, these top pie charts are in Pittsburgh on the left you see before COVID where uh, equal numbers of people uh, identified as male and female. On the right, the April survey where almost twice as many people identified as female than male. Uh, there's a similar pattern really across the country. You can see Las Vegas below is, is a little less stark in Las Vegas, but a similar pattern. Uh, next slide. Um, another disparity that was very clear across the United States especially was uh, a race disparity where um, people who identify as African-American were disproportionately represented during COVID and people who identify as uh, Caucasian underrepresented during COVID. So in gray, you can see the before COVID uh, um, breakdown in, the, in green, you can see the during COVID. And again, this is Pittsburgh, which I chose in part because we had, a, we had recent demographic work uh, before COVID. So it was a good basis of comparison. Next slide. Um, and, and lastly, we also asked a lot about employment, and that was really useful to, to really get confirmation of what we all know, that, which is you know, essential workers were the people still riding, uh, people in food service, healthcare, sales, things like that. Um, so I, I brought these up because um, in the geographic mapping, it's, it's very useful to be able to have these kinds of variables. And um, our survey work has been a valuable part of of uh, building maps and understanding discrepancies between usage and distribution. Uh, next slide. Oh, this is the uh, rush hour point I made before where you can really see uh, a flattening of the curve where, um, and a, a sort of a shift in the patterns. And the nice thing about our survey work is that we can then ask people directly about these behaviors. So we, we ask people how, their departure time shifted, how their return time shifted. And there's a clear shift towards earlier for the departure time in the morning and a shift towards in both directions for the afternoon. So that was, um, that was an interesting corroboration. Next slide, please. Um, great, and so connecting this to policy again, um, a question that 
we got a lot was when uh, cities when agencies suspended uh, fare collection due to COVID, was there a spike in, <laughs> in essentially joy riders, um, which hopefully sounds silly to you that people are joy riding public transportation during a pandemic, but um, it was really neat to see in the data that uh, we, we weren't seeing any evidence for something like that. So what you're seeing in front of you is New York. Um, the dotted line is when the MTA suspended uh, bus fare collection and and we saw really no uh, correlation in New York or or in other cities where fares were suspended. Um, so I, the the picture I'm trying to paint is public transportation data as as a tool towards um, measuring and understanding people's reactions to the pandemic itself, to public policy, to um, COVID rates in their region, and, and things like that. Uh, next slide, please. Great, so for, for us at Transit, we collect um, uh, some aggregate data on locations and trips. Um, and uh, next slide, you'll see um, Dayton, Ohio. This I took um, aggregate uh, activity in the app from um, just some of the morning rush hour period when the, our users are predominantly commuters. And um, if you go to the next slide, you'll see it the same period in 2020, you can see it's much less dense, but um, more than just seeing what we saw in the counts, uh, I was curious about whether in Dayton, the shift in uh, usage, if it was geographically associated with anything, um, you know, such as demographics from the census data, something like that. So uh, if you, in the next slide, you'll see I was um, comparing the 2019 to 2020 period where there was enough data. And um, the blue is where, uh, let's see, 2019 was, the activity was greater and the red is where it was greater in 2020. And I, I didn't find, I mean, visually, these are hard to parse, but also mathematically, I didn't find a significant relationship here with um, some of the underlying demographics, but um, it's the, this is where I <laughs> depart into sort of the, the area of work that we're still developing and building the ETL pipelines to analyze. But it's, I think, an interesting direction for public transit work in general that we, we can look at overall um, movement of people in aggregate and try to get a sense of who is being underserved, who are the people who have to take public transportation, and that hopefully can lead to different uh, policies, route planning decisions that can serve them better. Um, next slide. Um, this is a, an example of something I was, I was wondering would correlate with the uh, previous data you know, in Dayton. Unfortunately, like many cities in the United States, um, does have some strong um, racial segregation. On the left, you'll see from the um, ACS 2018 data, the, uh, the darker colors are for higher percentages of people who identify as black or African-American. On the right, it's for the darker colors are for people, higher percentages of people who identify as uh, Caucasian or white. You can see their uh, inverses. And I was wondering if that would, um, if we'd see that, so see a difference in the pre-COVID to during COVID um, distribution of behaviors and trips, um, uh, maybe associating with some of these demographics. Um, in, Dayton, in the case of Dayton, I haven't yet, but this is again, an ongoing project that I'll keep working on. Um, next slide. Also our demographic work we can use to uh, look at how it correlates to geography. So to continue talking about Dayton, you know, uh, one thing that was mathematically significant was people identify as white were taking much longer trips. Um, and that, uh, well, I, I, I don't really, <laughs> I, I have hypotheses that um, make me go on to the next slide. So to, overall, I'd like to talk about public transit as a COVID-19 indicator, next slide. Um, the, I've talked about how we have these basic counts of overall demand and how they alone have been powerful towards um, really measuring people's 
response to social distancing orders, uh, to measuring sort of the workforce dynamics during the um, crisis, and also as we re recover from the crisis, um, how the workforce might be, uh, how the dynamics might have changed, um, as well as an indicator of economic activity. But then when we add in the geotemporal distributions, for me, what I find particularly interesting is our ability to really look at discrepancies in access. We can do, um, you know, route level, the, the map you're seeing on the right, by the way, is a Boston map we made at a route level demand. Um, and that kind of analysis where we do route level demand uh, over time, looking at before COVID, during COVID and during recovery can has really had the power to address questions of equity and discrepancies in access. Um, and next slide should be, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having me at this talk. I think I learned <laughs> much more than I distributed, but it, it's really been an honor being here. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Great uh, talks from all of our session speakers today. Um, there are a couple of questions. Can Harvey, is it okay if I take two minutes for questions or just? A yeah, just a, two, yes, just a couple of moments for questions and then we're gonna move into a, a wrap up. Okay. Um, so I've, uh, I've got a, a question here about, well, let's see, was this for our session on contact tracing? Contact tracing discussion here sounds quite useful, especially considering no IDs are required. Ed, this question might be for you. Um, however, they often, however, they often uh, assume two individual physically present close to each other at a given time. How does the case interaction in closed space at different time, e.g. one person A used a seat in the classroom, later another person B got into the room after person A left, used the seat. If person A was diagnosed positive later, how could such a method capture cases like this? So really detailed, fine spatial resolution. Yeah, I mean, there is, there's a natural limitation, unfortunately. It, it, the technology is relying on the, the proximity of those two devices. Uh, at that time. So there's a, there's a spatio-temporal element to this. Um, I think as we've heard earlier on today, it, it appears that most of the, um, uh, the spread of the disease happened through you know, airborne particles, not so much from surfaces. So it's a, it's a lesser risk, but, but you wouldn't be able to pick up the fact that you know, someone had been in the room 10 minutes before you entered it because you, your phones would no longer be in proximity to each other. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting. And from our earlier discussions on contact tracing too, I think um, it would be interesting to know some from feedback. In other words, if you got a message saying you had been in someone's contact list, one of the questions you probably start to ask yourself is where could that have happened? And you'd want to know potentially yep. where, where did that happen? Um, and I think that's very much the case. I think that there is a recognition from the, the technology providers that the, the technological component, the, the contact tracing via devices, is just the starting point. You still need that human follow-up to go through, okay, where were you? What were you doing? And, and that the human aspect, I think, is really important, not only from the point of view that you're capturing data, but also from a, a, you know, a, a, a patient point of view of actually dealing with the fact that you're telling someone that they've potentially been infected. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, in that case, um, Harvey, why don't I turn things back to you for the last session? Wrap up. All right. Thanks, Kathleen. And thanks for the panelists in the last session. Again, this has been a real, um, really rich day full of lots of concepts and ideas and ways forward. And I, I hope that um, everyone's mind spinning like mine is right now. To, I have, I, gave, I asked, um, Mark Reich Reichhardt from the Mapping Science Committee to step up here in the last session and to give us a summary statement, and wrap this all up for us. So um, Mark is um, the president and CEO of the Open Geospatial Consortium in addition to being a member of the Mapping Science Committee. And he has the um, perhaps inevitable, you know, well, not inevitable, uh, uh, you know, not welcome task to try to wrap all this up in, in one quick statement. Um, 
but if anyone can do it, he can. Mark, please. Well, thanks, Harvey. I'm the past president and CEO of OGC. We have a, a new boss in place, but uh, still associated with the organization. Um, I really appreciate all the speakers today, all the panelists and their perspectives. Um, some things reached out to me that crossed all the boundaries of the presentations. Uh, of course, the, the diversity uh, and granularity of data types. This is a real opportunity, I think, for a follow on in terms of, I think, as one of the speakers mentioned, that collaboration to pull together uh, an understanding of the, the cumulative data sets that are required, uh, the accuracy, um, uh, information related to it, uncertainty and the bias that are presented in those data types. Um, I think that's a, a critical area of research. Um, we talked about the use of traditional geospatial data to feed the models and how the, that data affects the outcomes that are being predicted, but also tunes the R naught and, and uh, um, differential numbers. Uh, and I think that came out very, very clear. Um, but I think one of the things that was really interesting across most of the speak, uh, speakers was the use of mobility data, how that's a rather emergent and new capability. Um, it's showing a lot of promise, but it carries with it a lot of issues related to um, uh, privacy, uh, uh, methodologies to anonymize the data, but make it balanced enough so it's useful for the decision-making and the modeling process. Um, that data used not only in contact tracing, um, but also in modeling behavior that becomes a, a very strong input to understanding the policy decisions that need to be made, um, the types of public health situations uh, and preparedness that needs to occur. I really liked Ed's talk about breaking the glass. And I think everybody had a sense for that. Um, we talked a lot about preparedness and understanding the escalation of, a, uh, of an infection like COVID uh, and the repercussions. But what is the playbook necessary uh, amongst all of us to engage with less uncertainty and more, uh, more collaboration as we go forward? And I think it was um, uh, Josh that uh, mentioned um, initially uh, that petabyte playbooks coupled to interdisciplinary geospatial modeling capability are needed to respond to future uh, events, but to design for resilience. That to me was a major statement that ties all these discussions together, everything from the predictive side to the resilience side. And there's so many com commonalities here. Um, I just can't say enough about uh, the experimentation and the use of mobility data. I think that's gonna be a huge game changer and it needs to be a strong area of research. So uh, I have a lot of other things to mention, but I know we're getting close on, uh, we're over on time here, but uh, I think this, this really demonstrated across all the presentations about a number of seriously common threads uh, that we can move forward with. So I'll turn it back over to you, Harvey. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark, good job. Um, we do have about five minutes left. If anyone has any uh, final questions, we can, I can, we can and turn them into the Q&A, use the Q&A feature and I'd be happy to respond and send it off to any of the panelists throughout the entire day. Uh, just a comment, thanks to all the speakers, wonderful events, thanks for hosting. Yeah, th thank you for that comment. <laughs> I do think this has been really a terrific day. Um, we had a great collection of speakers. Um, there are some commonalities that I think those of us in the Mapping Science Committee will be processing for, for quite some time. We do have a committee meeting tomorrow, in which we'll discuss some of the threads and ideas that came out of this um, discussion and talk about ways forward that the Mapping Science Committee and others could, could continue development. Um, this is an unprecedented event in human history, and it does require unprecedented responses. And I, I do believe that geospatial data, mobility data, temporal data is, is really the, one of the first lines in, uh, in defense and mitigation and response to, to a pandemic like this. And um, I don't wanna end on a downer note, but I do wanna point out that this, this is not the last COVID or last, pandemic that will hit us that um, this this may be a way of the future so we do need to plan for our for our societies our cities and our economies to be able to um, be resilient against these type of events and just more generally um, there are other shocks coming of course um, some of them are social and human. Some of them are related to extreme weather and climate change. So I do think this is a general call for us as a society and for us as geospatial professionals to think about 
what role these new technologies, new data, these new capabilities we have, which really are quite amazing, as you saw in some of the presentations today, what can we do to really not just react when something like this happens, but to plan for a, uh, a society and economy and cities and neighborhoods that can that can res get, that can respond gracefully to these shocks and recover, and in fact, ultimately make our city stronger as we become more resilient in our in our societies. So I think on on that note, I'll, I'll wrap up maybe three or four minutes early. Well, before, let me just check the question here. Um, no, I'm just getting compliments about how great this event was. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate that. Um, someone's asking if they can get in contact with um, with several of the uh, panelists. With if it, there's a couple, there's at least one question about that, but I think that's a more general question. So I would just this this um, this will this video will be available publicly um, within a few weeks, and I'm sure that we can we can share the contact um, information of all the uh, presenters if people would like to get in contact with them. Okay, uh, I think I think we'll wrap it up then. So thank you everyone on behalf of the Mapping Science Committee and, and also on behalf of the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine. We thank you for your participation today and we hope you learned something and we hope that you go forward and make the world a better place with this knowledge. Thank you very much. Have, have a good evening.